This episode of the podcast is brought to you by HRH Combat Arms. They can turn your vision into reality. They specialize in gunsmithing and Cerakoting. Your Cerakote specialist is Air Force veteran and retired police sergeant Paul Ware, a.k.a. the Sarge. He can Cerakote your firearms, auto parts, tools, even your sports equipment. And then your master gunsmith is Marine veteran Steve Miller. This veteran-owned business is located at 5025 Saunders Suite, 103, Fort Worth, Texas, 76119. You can call them at 682-304-0363, and you can find them online at www.hrhcombatarms.com. That's www.hrhcombatarms.com. All right, here we are. Two cops, one donut. I'm your host, Eric Levine, back again. Special guest with me today is the uh, Marine veteran, Steve Miller. How's it going, buddy? Not too bad, man. How you doing? I'm doing good. I see you uh, just got out of work. Yeah, yeah, still in the work attire. Why don't you tell people where you work at? I don't know. I am, uh, like you said in your intro, I am the Master Gunsmith for HRH Combat Arms and Coatings. That's right, buddy. Right, so. Yeah, he's uh, he's he's done a lot of good stuff. Um specifically he helped me build that um some of the guns that we'll get to eventually but um i got one on the desk here i'm going to show you this was the one that he custom milled um put these ports up here on the slide all that good stuff it's a a really cool uh gun and you know what i just noticed this you almost have a boba fett yeah. color scheme going yeah i was trying to trying to kind of hey. didn't want to go too military with it wanted to kind of do some okay retro star wars with there that's what's up yeah it's a it's a clean uh good feeling gun i haven't got to fire it so i can't speak on that but we did show it off on the last episode with sarge which these people if they're watching this now they maybe will have watched it by the time this releases nice. so because his episode i believe is um next thursday which today is the 29th of July. Okay. So his will be August 5th, I believe. Right on. Right on. So we'll have that. So, Steve, um, there's a bunch of things I could talk to you about. Uh, your mar- Marine career, uh, stuff like that. How many years did you do? I'll just get that right out the Did uh, four active, four in. Four active, four in. Okay. So uh, I'm kind of doing the same thing. I did my four active, but I'm still in the reserves. Uh, I think I'm on my... 60 year of my reserve time nice i'm probably ready to re-up now that i think about it i did a six-year contract so yeah thinking about it now i probably if i'd have done it again go back to my younger self i probably would have gone yeah either lap moved into maybe the army like yeah. that and then gone yeah a lot of my friends uh well, actually i should say family members that are in or were in um my uncle al rivera he's a air force retired um now but he did the reserves and he was just like dude like I know it sucks, but stay in. It's worth it. It's yeah. worth it to have that second pension. It's worth it for the insurance, which the insurance is the big one, and the yeah. Disney discounts for the fam. Yeah. yeah. So right. I'm loving that part. So, well, uh, this show is about. Um, I had to check and make sure we were recording. <laughs> this show is about uh, uh, educating the public, um, kind of talking about frontliners. Obviously, you as a, a Marine vet, veteran, you're a frontliner, um, just not here in the States. Right. Uh, right frontliner, right. overseas, yeah. stuff like that. Um, where were you born? Where were you raised? How'd you get up into the military? Uh, well, um, I was born in Hobbs, New Mexico, actually, back in really? 1975. No shit. Yeah. You're born 75? Yeah. I thought yeah. you were around my age. You're a little older. Dude, I'm an old fogey now. I guess so. I, I, I would have never guessed. You keep you, you age well. Thank you. Good for that's you, the man. Indi- that's the Indian in me. Is that what yeah, it is? I'm, I'm going to claim that. Okay. I'm going to take that one. Nice. <laughs> Are you like less than 1%? Uh, I'm like one, <laughs> 128th or I'm, something like I'm that. I'm thinking so. of that one chick, that yeah. one politician is like, oh, yeah. I'm Native American. And it turns out like she's not even a I'm more African American than she, she is Native American. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so. Yeah. I got more soul than me. Than- <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I'm hoping that that camera is still recording, but uh, I see it blinking. We got a new camera, by the way, guys. HRH Combat donated uh, this camera that I'm pointing at right now, an Osmo Action. Um, My wide shot is an Osmo Pocket, so I wanted to stick with the brand. Chris Hatchett had come out and 
let me test one of these cameras out. So we switched to that. So we only got one more camera to go, and that's the iPad camera. And I believe uh, Paul said he'd get me the same setup next month when he's got a little more play money. So yeah, yeah most that's, definitely. That's going to be awesome. But um, So New Mexico, yeah. Uh, yeah. how long did you live there? Uh, it was a blink, brother. Yeah, it was a blink. Really? Yeah. When my dad, you know, being in the oil field, we moved around a lot. So. Oh, was your dad in the oil field and all that? Yeah, yeah. He was a petroleum engineer for Exxon and Coquina and Dresser Atlas and a bunch of others in the back okay. of the day. That are. But you call New Mexico home? That's yeah. where you. Yeah. Okay. So, with that, was there anybody in your family that had a call for service or anything like that? Uh, actually, the only other service member. Living at the time uh, was my grandfather on my dad's side. Like that, he was a he was a naval fighter pilot in the Korean War. No shit. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, his brother, I never knew his brother, never got to meet him. But he was in Nam. He was a Marine in Nam and got shot through the neck when he was supposed to be returning uh, back to the states. Really? Yeah. So he wasn't even never even knew him and didn't even know who okay. he was. I've heard stories after you know I kind of. Nobody knew I enlisted in my family. I kind of did it on the QT, and then yeah. about three days before I was supposed to ship out, I was like, hey, Mom, Dad, uh, I enlisted <laughs> into the Marine Corps. Right. Yeah. So, I'm doing my part. Yeah. I, said, I, I said, I'm leaving out in three days. I'll see you. Dang. Yeah. That's crazy. So you, did you do it right after high school? Right after. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. That's how they get Marines. It, yeah. Really, well, I mean, I you got to trick the kids, dude. I'm, I'm telling you, <laughs> if I'd been a chick, dude, the recruiters in the dress blues at the school would have been done for. Really? Yeah. I mean, oh, that's funny. The dress blues look good on again. Yeah, I will fully admit the Marines have the best uniform, yeah. hands down, and probably the best best military bearing. Yeah. Well, I we mean, we have to have the best uniform, otherwise nobody would talk to us. That's true. Yeah. yeah. What's that in your teeth? Uh, yeah, crayon. You know, crayons yeah. earlier. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So, you did you have, were there any other things that you wanted to do? Or was that like, I'm going to use this as a transition to figure out what I want to do? Yeah. Uh, that was, I think that kind of been a calling for me to do ever since I was a kid. I mean, I, you know, everybody when they're kids at one point or another wants to be a cop, wants to be a firefighter, like that. Um, I wanted to be a soldier. I got you. you. Know, I wanted to be that army guy on TV that you saw. You wanted to be all you could be. Yeah, but, and then, but more. And uh, <laughs> actually, the funny thing is, is uh, one of my best friends in high school, uh, he had enough credits to graduate and ended up leaving school early. Yeah. And uh, he went into the army, and he tried to get me to go into the army on the on the buddy program, and I just I saw the Marine Corps recruiting office, and I was like, I'm yeah, there. I'm there, I'm there. Yep. I was uh, I was going to join the Marines right out of high school and then had some baseball stuff going on and whatnot and uh, decided to try my hand at college a little bit. And then I kind of learned, I'm like, holy shit, like I got some friends that went into the Marines and I, I think I'm going to work a little smarter, not harder. So, <laughs> um, which, listen, people, anybody out there, no knock on the Marines for real. Like we need people with that mindset. It's just if if you have the self awareness to know that's not you, then by all means let the people that that know that that's them let them go do it. Because I want those that want to be there. I don't. Yes. You know how it is. Yeah. You don't like the ones that go there because they have an ego complex, and then they realize the Marines are bigger than their ego, and oh, they, yeah. they ain't gonna yeah. make it. Yeah, we had we had. I can't tell you how many people we'd have in boot camp that. Would, Cry all night long, just wanting to get out. Oh, jeez. Had one guy try to commit suicide by jumping off the third deck. That'll just break your legs. Yeah. I mean, you know, so it's a definite mindset. You've got to be willing to take yeah. the core. I don't know what it is like now because so much has changed uh, with the way culture is and all that. But right when I was going through, uh, it was, you know, you were going to take punishment. Yeah, physical, like you, mental, men, everything. Yeah, everything. You, you literally had to bear the load. Yeah, like and if you couldn't hack it, then you know you found yourself out on the street. This this uh, idea that drill instructors can't touch you and all that stuff—that yeah. wasn't a thing when no. you were going through. Yeah, brother, I pushed for an hour and a half 
uh, before graduation from boot camp in, Dang, my, you guys in, my, just in my dress con- uniform because I said the wrong thing to the drill instructor and I was in there just sweating. Was, Dang, uh, we made it. You can't touch us now. Yeah, <laughs> no. oh, I was, yeah. <laughs> I knew you wouldn't say something that dumb, but okay. Tell me, this is one of one of the main reasons I I love the Marines and always had a fascination with them is uh, Full Metal Jacket. The, love that movie. Yeah, I used I used to sit in my living room, like no joke. Deep dark secret about Steve Miller. I used to sit in my living room in my boxers on the floor with all my guns and my cleaning gear, cleaning and watch that movie for hours. That's awesome. Just that's Dude, it. The gunny, he nails it, man. Yeah, he yeah. nails it. That's a great and a great man. I, yeah. On a personal level, great man. Did you meet him? I met him at Shot Show uh, the first time. And then uh, we met him again at an event. That he was at that we just happened to be stumbling across and saw him and I shouted out, "Hey, Gunny, who raw?" Yeah. And he turned around, and gave me a new raw. So yeah, nice. he, no, he was a really straight up real good dude. That's good to hear. Yeah. All right, so there's going to be a lot of people out there listening to this um, that may be thinking about getting into the Marine Corps. Now I know times have changed, so if they do decide to get in, I want them to hear what it used to be like. I want them to know either how good they have it or maybe realize like, hey, when I get there, I can change some of the, the old school stuff. I can bring it back. So you sign up for the Marines. What's the recruiter telling you? What's all that? How did that process go first? Man, the recruiters are silver tongue devils. <laughs> I, I kid <laughs> right. you not. They probably could get. Should a, be lawyers. Yeah. They could Just probably get, get the Virgin Mary to sleep with them. That's how good, That's how slick they are. Really? Yeah. They, they will. uh and nothing for nothing. I mean, it sounds like you're like you know if you if you haven't been through it, and you're listening to someone tell you about how recruiters are, you're like, well, that's that's wrong. That's that's not right. That's trickery and stuff like that. But once you go through it, then you understand. Yeah. And that because I mean, you can't tell somebody, hey, I'm gonna put you in a to use the term shit sandwich every day. For the, for the course of your four, eight, 12, or 30 years that you do, yeah. that's what you're going to be doing. Nobody's going to want to join. I mean, right. nobody would join. Not even the dumbest of dumb would join <laughs> like that. But, uh, yeah, you know, and, and I think more so in the core that I've noticed than uh, other branches of the military. Uh, I've got a cousin in Florida who's a judge who's in the Air Force. And, uh I've got a cousin down in uh, Houston who was in the Army. He went through uh, A&M's ROTC, and then he was in the Army for a little bit, and now he's uh, a bigwig with Exxon. Okay. Um, but more so than anything else, like that, the walks of life that you get in the Marine Corps uh, vary from the poorest of poor and guys that were, you know, one strike away from spending life in prison yeah. to guys who grew up with silver spoons. Mm-hmm. Like that, who never wanted or needed anything, but they had a calling. They, yeah. had, they had they had that realization that uh, there was something more to them, and they owed somebody something. Yep. And that's kind of how I felt, uh, especially listening to some of the stories my grandfather used to tell back in the day. And uh, I mean, I I had to pay it back. Those yeah. guys gave us everything so that we could be sitting here today doing this, and I could do be doing what I'm doing. Yep. You know. Um, and we don't have to walk down the street with, you know, worrying about some armed militia coming up behind us and dragging us through the streets because we're there at a certain hour that we're not supposed to be. Yeah. So, you know, I had to, I had to pay it back. I had to get what, uh, what position? What was your MOS? Uh, I was a 03. I went in as an 0311, a uh, basic grunt. Okay. A rifleman. A rifleman. Yeah. And then uh, I went through the... I went through a couple different of the schools at uh, Division for mortars and... Stuff like that, the machine gunners, of course, all that. Okay. So I kind of got a, I got a very well-rounded education in the uh, infantry. All right. In, in infantry units, so not just from shooting, just to standard M16 to yeah. you know the the fully automatic 243s or a 240 Gulfs. Like so, that, so just so you know, now everybody that's listening to this and was considering getting a gun from HRH Combat probably just solidified that because you were a grunt. Yeah. They're probably like, okay. He knows his shit. He well, knows and, what he's doing. And a, and a great thing about too, uh, just if you know, not to 
I guess, uh, not really just to praise ourselves, but we do have AR classes that we do teach people how to build their own ARs. Yeah. So they come in and they don't just learn this part goes here, this part goes here. You learn a little bit of history about the AR. You learn actually what the AR really is. Yeah. Uh, Because there's a big misconception, especially amongst our so-called leaders that think that it's an assault rifle. Armalite. It's an Armalite. Armalite. Is that, that's what Ar- AR stood for. Armalite right? yeah, rifle. Armalite, yeah. yeah. Armalite rifle. Yeah. See, Air Force guys, we know a little bit. Well, I mean, I'm the, I expect y'all to. Yeah. I mean, y'all get to stay at the Riata and all that. But right. Why I'm staying at Motel 6. They don't even need <laughs> lights on for us. Exactly. <laughs> I'm, uh, um, I'm that, I just like to have guns. I believe in the Second Amendment. I like yeah. guns. It's just, I'm so busy with life now. Like, I know single me back in the day would if I could have afforded the weapons that I have now would have shot all the time. Oh, I'd have been a weapons I, I was, junkie. Yeah, single me always at the range. But I I haven't known single me since like seventh grade. I've been with my wife that long. So uh, arranged I, marriage is something. I like. know, right? <laughs> Michigan's weird. <laughs> but we've been together for so long, and you know, we got married, had kids, and I never lived that actual true single man life so when i get a little bit of money and i come throw it at you you guys I'm like well, we here's what i'm we thinking yeah. can you do it and you're like yeah, hell yeah let's do it and so i actually and you can confirm this what did i say to you today i told you i said hey i got a 43 I, i'm thinking about just giving it to you see what you can do with it oh i'm, I'm waiting i'm just, confident just, a bit i've already got ideas that are spinning just uh, because that's what he does guys uh, i know we're jumping off topic a little bit but one of my favorite things about steve is that he gets an idea, and whether he's wrecking his own gun or spare parts or whatever it is, he's testing things out and trying to see what he can get away with and uh, push that creative boundary. So I like that. But um, So you get Marine Corps, and before you get assigned, you got to go to basic. Mm-hmm. So what time of year, where did you go to basic? I went to Camp Pendleton. Okay. Or MCRD San Diego. So I ended up to Pendleton. So that, that's a, a call you guys the Beach Boys or something like that? Oh, yeah, we're Hollywood Marines. Hollywood yeah. Marines, that's what it is. Yeah, Hollywood, every day as you're watching that Freedom Bird come in and take off because it's right by the San Diego International Airport. Oh, okay. And that, you just watch them every day. And you're sitting in there just thinking of mom, dad, and, you know, <laughs> your girlfriend back home, and you're watching a plane come in yep. and go out. And then you got some guy over here threatening to beat you 40 ways from Sunday. <laughs> Eyes front. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you show up. Now what t- – tell me what it's like. You, you rode a bus there, I'm assuming. Right. Yeah, we left uh, We left Dallas International or, or DF, DFW and flew into Denver – and had a one hour layover in Denver, and we decided that we were going to go drinking. Okay, like that. So we snuck into the the in, I guess the little officers club they had there. The okay, the little lounge, yeah, like that. And uh, one of the guys had a fake ID, and we're, he's buying us all drinks, and we're getting just tore up. And we get on the next plane and head into San Diego. It's a good and way to start out your soon, marine <laughs> marine career. Oh man! As soon as we got off the, off that plane and we stepped outside, it was. In your face. I just remember some guy no bigger than a number two pencil that probably scared me straight. I mean, I, I could have been the gayest person in the world, and he would have scared me straight. Because, <laughs> like uh, I mean, he was very intense. Okay. Very intense. And uh, yelling us to get on this bus. And we get on this school bus that looks more like a prison bus. Yeah, like that, that old uh, yellow, not yellow, but like beige. beige yeah, yeah. yeah. And bars on the window so you can't get out. Yeah. You know, like and um, sitting there and he's telling us, head down, look at your book, memorize your papers and stuff like that. And he goes, I better not see you look up. And it's pitch black in there. You can't see anything. You can't even read. And he's Catching yet, a street light. <laughs> yeah, the whole time from airport to basic, the entrance to basic, he's just nonstop. And this guy is like knows from zero to 100 and there's nothing in between okay like and you don't know how to shut it off it's how long is the ride I, you know i don't remember yeah it, it seemed like an eternity. so stressful because yeah. yeah it seemed like an eternity but it's probably more just a couple of minutes really so you didn't get you didn't get a here it comes time Mm-mm. see i did i got lucky i, I guess because yeah. you know you load up on the the bus you know i i'm in texas so i flew from michigan um came down here 
and there wasn't really any, it was very quiet. It was just, shut up, don't talk, bus ride. And you're like, okay, this ain't bad yet. Like, I wonder what it's going to be like. And then you get there and you see them just waiting like sharks, Mm -hmm. a ton of them. So I was curious if you had it worse. I knew it was going to be worse at some Marines, but um, I was curious. There's no buildup like you. Yeah, it was like it was like as soon as we stepped off, you went from civilian to nothing. Yeah, in like less than a second. And when you showed up to MCRD, it's like you got on the yellow footprints. They got literally got yellow footprints painted on the ground. And you had to go stand on them, and it was just those guys. There was nobody else out there yelling at you or anything like that. It was just those guys on the bus, and they pushed you through. I think that's the fastest I ever had a haircut, been stripped out of my civilian attire, and put into camis and sweats and some god awful ugly ass tennis shoes like that to start off with wearing and not mm-hmm. knowing anything or anyone you don't know the guy next to you behind you to the side of you you're all looking straight ahead uh, you're getting very intimate knowledge of the back of his the guy in front of his head and that's it yeah like that. and you're just pushing through this line like a, an assembly order like that. and then for the next three days it's no sleep no sleep Really? Yeah, you're up. There is no sleep. You're up. You're marking your clothes. You're stamping your gear. You're making yeah. everything work. And they're putting you on these kind of just a fill time makeshift little guard post you're supposed to stand. And you're like, and they're like, if somebody comes in here, you better take them down. And you're like, what? <laughs> Dude, I'm 100. I'm six foot two, graduating high school at 18 years of age. Most of my friends were six foot, pushing 200 pounds. I was six foot of 125. Jeez. I was the number two pencil. Yeah, you were. Like that. I mean, I mean, I made number two pencil look like Schwarzenegger. <laughs> like um, as a matter of fact, it's funny because I laugh at it now. Back then it used to make me mad, but now it's it's just hilarious. But um, my nickname back in high school was Skeletor. Because like oh, yeah. you could literally count the ribs. As soon as I took my shirt off, you could count my ribs. So... I go into the core and we're doing this and we got dropped to our platoon after this three days of no sleep. We get dropped to our platoon. And, uh, I, I remember our senior gunnery sergeant, uh, our drill instructor was a gunnery sergeant. and He looked at me and he goes, you're a double rat. Oh yeah. And Lucky I was, bastard. I was like, what's a double rat? I had no idea. I'm, I'm whispering to the guys. They said, what's a double rat? He's like double rations. Double rations of what? They're like food, idiot. <laughs> Every <laughs> meal. Every meal. Yeah. And I First did. in, last out. First in, last out. I sat with the guide and the squad leaders. And if I finished before them and they weren't done, the drill instructor would come over and make them put their food on my plate. You table and, fuck them. Yeah. And, and I'd have to eat all their stuff. So I had to sl- <laughs> I had to time it just right to yeah. you know, not be a you know blue falcon on them or anything yeah. like that. So, yeah. Uh, Chow, Chow was interesting. Yeah. Chow so for those listening, and if you're not familiar with boot camp at all, when you go in to eat Chow, and it was the same when I went through, so it was later than what year did you go in? I went in in 94. Okay. So yeah, I went January in 94. I went in 06. So quite a long time after yeah. you. And it's a, it was the same when I went through. But when you go into Chow, you fall in the line. You know, that first dude in, he goes to the farthest table. As he get when he gets his food. Now, the next table behind him, if they finish their food before that guy finishes food that sat down, now both tables are made to get up. Mm-hmm. So imagine you've got 30, 40, 50 tables of troops, and you just sat down and five tables ahead of you finishes or, or behind you finishes before you, and you get effed and you gotta go out. You, you don't know that necessarily when you get there yeah. those first few days, and you got to learn that system real fast. Now, hopefully, somebody had warned you about it before you went. I got lucky. I had people tell me I went in blind, so I guided these dudes the first time we went in yeah. before we got in there. And uh, I went in completely blind, not oh, knowing yeah. all the only thing I had knew before I enlisted was I wanted to be a marine. That's all I knew. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know. What chow is going to be like, basically is going to be like, I didn't know nothing. I mean, you you didn't have the internet really to help you then. No. And and the recruiters, the only thing they did was run you in a circle. 
you get out there, run you in a circle, and do calisthenics for a year Man. until you get ready to leave. Dang. On that, so. so you go in, you get, you, you're getting the process of everything. What is it like? What, what's the, what's the morale like with everybody else? What, what is being said once the drill instructors aren't around? Not that there's a lot of opportunity, but man, you know, you know, the, uh, we never really said anything. No, that, that first, the first couple of weeks we were there, nobody talked. Everybody just shut the fuck up. Nobody wanted to be the one to get you burned. Everybody was too scared to even whisper. I mean, if you, <laughs> if you let out a fart, you were freaking out because you thought the yeah. uh, drill instructor just heard that and I'm toast. And, like, and your drill instructor slept. Right there in the barracks. In the barracks. They have yeah. their own quarters, but yep. same. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when I went through, mine was like intermittent. It was weird. Like, I honestly think that that dude, my drill instructor, like would leave sometimes. <laughs> now, I don't know if he's still in. I'm not going to say his uh, name. I don't know if that's even allowed. I, I don't know what the rules are for the drill instructors. Well, I know we had a we had a duty that stayed there overnight, and then you had usually the strong J would show up and then the gun, uh, your, your main drill instructor, your senior drill instructor would show up after. Okay. At the, right before. All right. So you're in there. You've, you, you've started to get the hang of things, starting to get into a groove. What was your job? Cause they assigned everybody a job. I was, I, I guess the first, about the first, uh, month or so of basic, uh, my job was sweating in the classroom. Okay. Like that. I got put, I did, I, I think I did more push ups and other exercises you could possibly think of in a little one square meter circle that you could possibly do. I mean, so they didn't have you like, you know, you're the battle liner, you're the. No, no, everybody, yeah. everybody was responsible for your own rack. You made your own rack, you made it look like everybody else's. If it didn't look like everybody else's, then. They came through and they tore everything apart, yeah. and then you had to go find your stuff and put it back together. So, um, and a lot of that was uh, a lot of that is so that you learned to depend on each other, so that you would say, "Hey, you know, yeah. we're all doing it this way," and kind yep. of start working. Together. And there's always somebody that's the strongest, or the few right. people that are stronger at a certain thing, and you're like, "All right, yeah. you know, Lopez, you come over here, you help me, help him do this because you're really good at it," or. You know, he comes over, at least teaches you how to do it, stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. And first, first phase, man, first phase is just, it's, it's fear. It's uncertainty. You're not knowing anything. And there's a lot of letters home. You know, I, I went back and my dad showed me all the letters I wrote him after I got out. And he's like, I want to show you the letters you wrote me. And the f- first, that f- through that first phase of uh, Marine Corps boot camp, I didn't even know that person when I was going back and reading those letters. I was like, God, who is this? It's not even a thought you would yeah, have. This, this is, this is somebody who's, you know, not in the right mind weak and spineless and, or yeah. whatnot. And then you start reading the letters as you get further on down the line. And it's like night and day change. And you really are. Uh, they tell you, um, like going back to full metal jacket and he goes, you know, your, your heart can belong to Jesus or whatever deity you want it to belong to, but your ass belongs to the core. Yeah. Like that, and it's the truth. I mean, you do belong to the Marine Corps. You are. You go in, Joe Schmo, and you come out. You know, a U.S. Marine. You are reborn. Yeah, like that, and that's just the way it is. So, how long did it take before you finally like? I'm, rela- uh, I, I'm, I'm relaxed as I can get. It's the first time where you're like. I think that it was right after we're in second phase. We're up in Camp Pendleton. We're doing all our field training. We're learning how to, you know, crawl through the mud and the muck and land nav and shoot a rifle. Yeah. The shit you pictured the, when you were going to get in. Yeah, the stuff yeah. I wanted to do. I'm like, man, where are the machine guns at? And I want to shoot, you know, the rocket launchers and all that. And uh, it was right after we were getting ready to come back down to the start third phase, and you kind of like, man, I got this. Yeah. This is in the bag. Yeah. This is easy. And you get back to third phase, Training, the uh, physical training gets a little bit more intense. Then it's drill practice, uniform prep, and stuff like that. And it's yeah. after that, you kind of know, man, I'm, I'm solid. I love drill. Did you like drill? I know a lot of people don't. I liked it. I didn't. I didn't hate it. Yeah. Didn't hate it. But it yeah. wasn't my my top of my to do list was I was a PT nut. I loved to get out yeah. and just run and do the exercises. 
I think I liked it because I didn't, it wasn't a part that I had thought of getting in. Yeah. Um, and what I mean by drill is uh, marching around and somebody's calling a cadence, uh, uh, a, a Jody. What, did you guys call him Jody's? No, no. No. I mean, I know the other no. name for Jody. but Yeah, jo- Jody was the guy that was back home with your girlfriend. While you're deployed, yeah. While you're deployed. Yeah. Or, you know, <laughs> yeah. I heard that, but another name for, for the songs were Jody's because typically the songs were self-deprecating. We'll yeah. put it that way. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I loved marching. I just liked it. And you, when you got a shit hot drill instructor that could call a badass cadence, oh, yeah. and and a, it's a you know a cool song, you know that just gets you amped up, and you could march forever, yep. forever. Even when you're running in formation, you're doing double time. Yep. A, a a good cadence, man, can keep you right. You know you. You get tired at three miles, and a it, good it, cadence comes on, and all of a sudden you're you're right back into it. Yeah. It paces your breathing. It yeah, just, it just totally takes over you, and you're mm-hmm. you know, and calling this, it when you, know. you call the cadence. Like that's a total another skill set. Yeah, that's that's chills up and down. Yeah, yeah. so it's it's fun. I I don't know. I guess that was the unexpected um, thing that I liked the most out of yeah. going through boot, and then once you get into the real world of active duty. The, kind of goes away um it it, it (laughs) comes comes back here and there when you get in trouble or whatever but for the most part you you, you get away from the the marching and the cadence and that sucked that sucked i like doing that stuff but for the marine corps i mean you think a full metal jacket every gnarly lyric cadence you can think of (laughs) yeah yeah and then some that you could make up as long as it flowed and rhymed yeah nobody cared yep so uh when i was going through i will say that the the more vulgar stuff was being like you had to be careful where you said it. Yeah. Like that was the the vibe then. Now, because I'm still in and I still work, I work at Lackland. It's a that's our basic training base, right? And I hear the basic trainees stuff, and then I hear you know like the the tech schools, like the police uh, academy for the, it's the military cops, their school. And, you know, like that's gone. They don't. Yeah, no more. No more. No more. A little, little more PC. Yeah. So uh, I think that's that's an important history lesson for anybody that's going to get in now to know, like, this is where it was at. Oh, yeah. And then and then I'm that middle phase because you went in a lot earlier than I did. Shit, I was – you went in during, like, Desert Storm. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty and, much. And that, was, and that was a big thing because uh, they were – I was, uh, I remember I was on a ski trip with my church group, uh, still in high school when that took off. Yeah. When that, when that war started. And I just knew, I said, I want to be, I got to be. You saw, you saw yeah. the, these colors don't run shirts out there. Oh yeah. And I was like, man, I'm, I'm, that's me. I've, I've got to do yeah. it. I've got to be it. Yeah. I, I remember wearing those shirts yeah. back in the day. These colors don't run. And yeah. it was, you know. The corniest little gray. Well, for Michigan, you know, it's, everything's a sweater, sweatshirt. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, sweatshirt. Texas, everything's a tank top. So, you yeah. Know. yeah. All right. So you go through there, and you do your four years active duty, so starting in '94. Yep. Desert Storm still going. They're winding down. Winding down. I think they were mostly on uh, bringing everybody home. That okay. They were, that they were going to bring. Okay, you know, keeping a few people back over there, uh, right. and that was the biggest thing was this, that we got told while we were in the fleet was at any moment like that because we were still active. Yeah, over there we could be called to go over there, and I think it was um, my unit when I got to drop to my unit in in the fleet Marines. They were on guard duty because they just rotated back from a deployment, and so. My first experience in the fleet Marine Corps was every other weekend was four days off. So I'm like, man, this is great. No shit. Yeah, I'm four days off all the time. And I was constantly out in bars. I was down in Mexico all the time on the weekend, San Diego surfing. Yeah. Just enjoying it. And then uh, 95 rolls around and they're like, okay, let's work up. We got to work up, up to our next deployment. We start doing weapons training. You're doing field maneuvers. You're. Like that, and it was constantly out in the field, never at the barracks. You know, you were sleeping out, and that was, I remember uh, the very first time that we went to the field. I took that big. We had those big, huge winter style sleeping bags. Those big. I mean, oh yeah, the, the layered ones. Yeah, real, real super thick. 
And uh, I took that to the field with me. So I'm like, man, I'm, you know, I'm going to sleep good. And that thing sucked carrying it around, especially oh. when the, the dew and the moisture would hit and that thing would just soak, soak it up. up. Yeah. And it was heavy. I woke up one morning out in the field with a rattlesnake in the bottom of my sleeping bag. And that was the first and last time I ever took a sleeping bag to the field. No shit. After that, I never, it never came out of the foot locker. It stayed in the locker back in the barracks. It never How came the out. hell did that happen? Like that. Uh, well, Camp Pendleton's a wildlife reserve. Yeah. And uh, you can't kill nothing out there. If you get caught, it's NJP'd, you're fined. You, I mean, you got civil penalties and everything else that come against you. Like that. So they told me, they said, you can't kill a snake. I, I felt, I said, dude, there's something in my bag. And they're like, no, there's not. And I was like, yeah, there's down in my bag. And you see, you see, you see out of my sleeping bag doing this number moving around and i came flying up out of that bag didn't even unzip it i was just right out of the top of that thing. wow and they opened it up and sure enough there's a rattlesnake down in there just trying to keep warm dang and that's so, scary and that was, that was after that i was like no more bag i slept with the this the iso mat that foam mat yeah and a poncho that was it that's all i took to the field to sleep in it's funny you mentioned the rattlesnake stuff, because when I got stationed in Montana, I didn't know they had rattlesnakes in Montana. I would never guess. I would have never thought, because of how cold it gets. Yeah. Eskimos, they, maybe. They have a lot. Yeah. A lot. I mean, every summer, and even in the fall, I ran into rattlesnakes. Wow. As, and I'm an avid outdoor guy, so yeah. it made sense to see what you know a lot of stuff, well, we, but I didn't yeah. expect to see a bunch of rattlesnakes. Yeah. Well, West Texas... Southern New Mexico, man, we grew up with them everywhere. Yeah. It's just natural to see them all the time. Not for me. Like that, so. so you're lucky you got out of there without getting bit. Yeah. Because yeah. shit, medical care at that time <laughs> may have taken a minute to get there. <laughs> right. right. You at least had a Blackfoot or something. Oh, man, I, I, I got a snake bite story for you. Um, my first deployment overseas, we were in Okinawa, Japan. Mm. Like that, and we are Bucket list for me. Oh, man. It's... Uh, if I could move back there, as a, if I had enough money to move back there and, and just not do anything but own a bar or a parlor or something over there, I would do it because Okinawa is gorgeous. Really? It's absolutely gorgeous. And the water to dive in over there is just beautiful. Nice. And around there. Yeah, I've never been there. Everybody. I, I haven't met a single person that's gone to Japan and, uh, and hasn't loved it. Yeah. It's, Everybody it's, loves it. It's amazing. It's and I amazing. bet you were a giant over there. Oh, yeah. People are like this tall. <laughs> <laughs> You're walking around. Yeah. Like but, but anyways, we're in the we're back in the woods. We're doing land nav like that. And uh, I remember one of my buddies said, man, I got to He goes, I got to go. He goes, I got I to gotta make a head call. I was like, all right, go ahead. Head over. So he goes around behind this tree. Next thing you know, you hear him call out this bloody murder. We run over there. Well, he got bit in the ass by a three-fanged habu snake. Which is, I mean, the snake's real poisonous. Really? Uh, yeah, and they're they're pretty aggressive. It's called a habu? A habu snake. Never heard of that. I've heard of like a and, haibusa, uh, but I don't even know if that's a snake. And uh, so we, Doc is over there, and he's like, man, he's like, suck the poison out. He's like, nah, like that. So they called in a medevac, get him up there, and they have all the antivenom and stuff like that, so they were pumping a full antivenom back to the hospital, and he's got a nice little scar on his. Man. But now, so he made it out there. So he got bit in yeah. the ass by a snake trying to take a shit. Yeah, and then and then two days later, <laughs> we're doing uh, some aggressor and defensive position maneuvers against uh, the scout snipers up there, you know, helping them train. And we found this pineapple field. Like that. So we're like, oh man, fresh pineapple. So we're out there, we're picking some far- poor farmers' pineapples and just eating them. Okay, like, they're fresh out of the ground. Just so good. So good. And then we found this little water hole where the stream came down and kind of created this little, probably a lake about maybe 30 feet across. At the, I think at the deepest, it was like maybe 20 foot deep. Okay. Like that. And we're jumping off this little cliff into the water and swimming around. Buddy goes swimming over. Next thing you know, the snake that was curled up under, on a, underground and it's like this little bowl in a rock comes shooting up out of the water and it's striking at the back of his head. Like they're trying to get him. But like aggressively? Oh, yeah. yeah. Wow. I guess he stepped on it or something, and it just came up, and it's sitting there just trying to tag him in the back of the head, but it can't get him because he's wet, and he's freaking out. Like that. So we're getting sticks. We're grabbing branches, and we're beating a snake. In turn, we're beating him because we're beating the snake. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> was it like uh, stuck on him or was it? No, it was it was swimming up his back. He's trying to swim upstream away from it, and the snake oh. is swimming up his back, trying to. I gotcha. Get to the back of his oh, head shit. to bite him. And uh, we ended up we ended up killing the snake, and we cooked it and ate it that night. Yeah, like that. So. I did the same with yeah. the. Um, I was fly fishing, and uh, I thought, uh, you know, it, it's nothing for in the river logs and stuff to float past you. So I, I always grab them and throw them off to the, the shore. So see what I think was a log, end up being a rattlesnake, grabbed it, threw it over the side, and it was one of those stupid moments where you're like, I realize what it is as I'm grabbing it, but it's like my my mind hasn't caught Pro- up. Processed it yet. And I've already old. grabbed it, and I'm like, oh, shit. So I throw it off the side. Well, the water was fairly cold, and it was real lethargic. Yeah. And uh, I realized that once I threw it up there. And I'm not scared of snakes. Snakes don't really bug me. Um, spiders do. Spiders. I don't do spiders I got chased. I got chased down a mountain by a spider. In, Oka- in Okinawa. <laughs> we'll get to that story in a second because that sounds really awesome. I need to know about that, know that enemy. And um, so I threw it off to the side, and then I got to thinking, I'm like, because he didn't really scurry off or anything. And I was like, he's cold. He's he's not he's not moving well. And I heard rattlesnake was real good. Oh. So um, I had grabbed another log that I had thrown out earlier and just clubbed it in the head once and skinned it, and we cooked it that night and it was good it's, i just washed it in the river yeah. and tastes like chicken yeah better than chicken and there, there's a lot of meat a lot mm-hmm. i mean they're like short they're, they're not this one was maybe four and or four and a half feet yeah. and they're just thick ass snakes yep. and uh it was good i loved it but um it was i just wanted to say i did it, it was why i started i just wanted to be that guy who like, yeah, cooked a snake you know yeah. and uh I end up liking it. But yeah. so you got first off, how do you see a spider on a trail that chases you? How does that happen? All right, so <laughs> he's preparing. We're we're actually doing our little land nav and I'm point. All right. And we're in this little riverbed. And across the top of this riverbed, you can see probably about six, seven foot up, is this huge web. That strings across this. I mean, tree to tree. It's like something out of you'd expect to see in a movie somewhere. And it's just this giant web going across. And we're all sitting there and looking at it going, holy. It's like arachnophobia. Yeah. And a buddy of mine, he takes this stick, probably about as long as this knife, you know, you know, pretty good size, heavy. Throws it up in there, and all of a sudden this big, huge black spider comes dropping down out of this tree. And uh, I got some right here. And... Uh, investigates this stick and we see him we're sitting there watching him cut it out of his web and repair the web and take back off and we're like oh man that's the craziest thing ever that, that's like super spider you know spider-man didn't yeah. have anything on him and uh so anyways we go all about our business we're like that well apparently the area we're getting into there was a lot of those spiders around there and i wasn't paying attention and i hit a web and didn't know it and one of them had you know i've got probably 10 feet between me and the guy behind me and the spider drops down and he's taken off toward me because I disturbed the web and I've got web dragging on me and he's coming to investigate. Well, everybody starts telling me run like that. So I'm just, I didn't know. I just turn it, just started tearing ass down this hill as fast as I can. And they're like, it's trying to catch you. It's trying to catch you. What the fuck? And the only thing we had, we had we had blank firing at the BFAs on the end of our weapons because we're firing blanks. Out right. There. So there's a little bit of fire. So I'm turning around and I'm trying to shoot behind. How me big with, is this thing? With a blind, and they said they said that thing was probably about a pie plate. What the like hell? Like that leg spread around, just huge. In like, Japan, yeah. yeah, dude. If you one, if you would have told me there's venomous snakes in Japan, I wouldn't have thought that. No. I thought you know that's an island. Probably not. It must have been introduced somehow, and then. Spiders. spiders. I wouldn't have thought. You know, we called them. Uh, we called them banana spiders. They're not banana spiders, but we called them banana spiders just because they were so big. Yeah, it, it's funny. It's kind of like a default name people give those big spiders, like those um, orb weaver spiders that they have down here, because yeah. they've got that yellow bands that go across them. Those are really cool spiders to see. I don't want to be by them. Dude, those are the creepiest damn things. I hate them. They start yeah. bouncing their web. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> Calm yeah. down. Yeah. Exactly. I. I my daughter and I were, I took her fishing and um, 
there was a tree. He had his web like kind of angled at the ground, but I saw him from like, I, no doubt about a hundred yards. I could see him yeah. floating in the, in the air, like it, cause he's on the web. It looked like from that distance, I just, in the, in just the way the sun was angled, I'm like in my body, I'm having this internal panic attack. <laughs> cause I'm like, Oh my God, she doesn't see it yet. So, but I'm also that guy that like, all right, I've got time to adjust. I see it. Now I got to go look at it because I want to know, like I want, like I said, I want to know my enemy. So right. we went up there and showed it to her and then promptly got the hell away from it. Now I'm paranoid everywhere I was going around that pond to yeah. figure it out. But did the you wind, ever, the wind blows just right. <laughs> did, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Did you ever figure out the name of that spider? Never, never. never. It really. And after that, I didn't care to. Oh, shit, <laughs> it's not like man, I'm going be, back to figure it out. I'd be looking that stuff. I'm going to look yeah. it up after the show. I'm curious. That's I, a, I told my wife that story when we first met and now I've got two boys and they love bugs, bugs, spiders. They want to see it all. My oldest wants to go swim with the sharks. My youngest wants to eat everything he can get his fingers on. <laughs> so whenever they catch a spider in the house, the first thing they want to do just come throw it on dad. Oh, because they know dad's they scared know of spiders. Yeah, because some... my wife told the boys, "Hey, dad's scared of spiders. Don't mess with them." Yeah, so that's, that's fun until you knock going, a lump in their head. Yeah. So, but uh, you, you quickly get over your fear when your kids are involved because you know I, I can't go out like a punk with my, with my oh, two boys. Oh, I don't know. I'm lucky I have daughters. Yeah. I because I, uh, I don't think. Yeah, Dad's gonna turn into a punk real quick if yeah, they start so, chasing me with a spider. So I've I've had those little jumping spiders and all that thrown yeah. on me. I've had so it's the, that's the only spider that doesn't bug me. Yeah, is the little fuzzy and, jumping spiders. Yeah, they don't bother me that much. I've had, uh, but the other ones like the Texas spiders. Yeah, fuck all of them. Yeah, like any of them. The black widows are the worst. Oh, the we, absolute worst. The police academy where I work, they're everywhere. Yeah. Under the picnic tables, all over the the drainage pipes coming from the. The top of the building, yeah. everywhere, and they no, yeah. those are people don't realize if you've never seen a black widow, you look at it and you see this big ass, big ass. It's got bulb. a big bulb, yeah, yeah. and then you're looking and you're like, oh man, yeah, they're kind of creepy. And if you a wind or whatever startles them, it you see this, <laughs> like their legs go out way farther than than what they look because yeah. they're never just spread out. No, they're yeah, always they're all, like their legs are all tucked in. Yeah, but when they move and their legs are out, they get enormous. They're big, bigger yeah. than I thought. Um, right, Jamie Johnson, this guy I worked with, he <laughs> he had a, a bad encounter with with the Black Widows. At I the, had to, I had to, when I was in Colorado, uh, when I was going through the my gunsmithing school, at then um, we didn't have AC units. They don't have AC in Colorado. It's no. so weird. I had heater, but no AC. Yeah. So I'd always keep my windows open. Well, I had a wooden TV tray. It was what I ate on. I was, you know, then oh I was watching God. TV. I don't know when to hear this story. And I was kicked back in my chair one night, had my legs up on the chair, up on the TV tray, just kind of watching TV, surfing channels like that while I'm reading through some books and doing some stuff. And then decided I was going to get up and put TV tray up away and head out in town. And... Something told me to look underneath that table. As soon as I kicked my legs down looking at the table, there was a brown. Brown recluse? No, black widow. What? It was a brown widow. It looked, it's, it's exactly the same shape, mm -hmm. same hourglass, everything is a black widow. Just but brown. But it's like mud brown. No shit. Huh. But, um, and it's probably some 10 times more deadly. This, you, you know, you know, and, some uh, freaky. That kind of, yeah, that freaked me out. And I was like, man, how am I going to get this out of my room? So I got. And the only thing I have in my the strongest thing I have in my room is 409. There you go. Like that. <laughs> so I was hosing this sucker down with 409, getting it drop on the floor. And I'm, I look like a, an old woman in, you know, those Japanese shows with the flip flop just <laughs> going at it, trying to, <laughs> trying to kill this thing with my old shower shoe. And my house would have been on fire. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm about ready to burn the dorm down oh, because of that. My luck, I would have seen like some open cocoon where the babies had already hatched. Yeah. The arachnophobia, the movie. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I, can't, yeah. I, I won't go in a house with a basement that's not finished. It, yeah. 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 That's where the, the mother's yeah. den was, yeah. yeah. Scary shit. That movie freaked the hell out of me when I was a kid. That in, in the yeah. movie Ghost. Because they came out around the same time. Yeah. And I, I, think, 
the ghost and stuff never really bothered me. Well, and that okay. I was a kid, so yeah. for you, you were like a teenager or something, yeah. probably when that was out. Huh. But uh, I was making you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, <My> dad. <laughs> um, yeah, but that I the only reason I put those two movies together because when I watched Arachnophobia, it was a double feature at the drive-in. Uh. So that's how I had watched them, and I was already scared of spiders. That didn't help me at all. Uh. And uh, yeah. Fuck spiders. Anyway. Um, <laughs> all right. So you deployed. How many times did you deploy? Uh, went overseas twice. So you went to Japan, did your time over there. How many years did you do in Japan? Just uh, a year? No, we did six months uh, okay. each stretch in Japan. This The first time it was just uh, Japan, and then we did an exercise down in Hawaii. So we got to go hang out in Hawaii. Yeah, and cruise the island on mopeds because they wouldn't let us rent cars. So we were cruising around on mopeds, and there's actually biker gangs in Hawaii. Like that, so that's cute. Yeah, it's it's nice when you're on a got a group of five guys on a moped, and you get thirty guys on Harleys pulling up around you, all looking at you, and the women are like, "Oh, I could kick your ass." All I think about is South Park episode, the Harley guys. Uh. <laughs> that's all I can think about. <laughs> Yeah, they think uh, we're cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, we don't. No. <laughs> no. Yeah, we got made fun of that day, uh, which I'm cool with, you know. It's, you're, on, you're on an island. Yeah, I'm on an island. There's nowhere I'm going to go that yeah. they haven't been. Live, live like the My people little five-mile-an-hour moped is not going to get away from that. Uh, yeah, that's true. You're not getting yeah. away. You uh, might as well set up a defensive posture and yeah. go to work. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, and then the, the second time we went to Japan, we went to – I actually got to go to Thailand and hit all those. And I bet you did. Oh, man. Did you find some ladyboys? Uh, no, actually no ladyboys. We, re- we didn't really run into any uh, ladyboys. I got pointed out where the ladyboys were by Mama-san, who took really good care of us. Okay. Like that, everybody so. I know that goes to, all joking aside, but everybody I know that goes to Thailand loves it. Yeah, actually, it's great. I mean, you, you take I took one of my paychecks at the time, which you know, five hundred bucks. No, I wouldn't even make that. I was making I made each of my paychecks two hundred and seventy five dollars. <laughs> Look at you after tax every paycheck. Yeah, like that. And that two seventy five, I hooked up with this one girl out in town, and I just gave her my whole paycheck. She fed me, bathed me. It paid for her rent, and she made sure Daddy was taken care of. That's what's the up. Time. There you yeah, go. Like that. And I lived like a god on two hundred yeah. seventy-five dollars. And I was like, man. And then you get back to the states. You're like, two seventy-five won't buy you a hamburger anymore. And I'm broke. Yeah, yeah. I'm broke. <laughs> yeah, uh, I have a, a sergeant friend that's retiring, and that's where he's moving. He goes there every year. Loves it. There's a lot of there's a lot of uh, their money goes a long way. Yeah, there's a lot of guys. We met a guy that owned a bar over there. It was actually a SAS. Mm. Uh, he retired SAS and he's, he's over there. Yeah. The, um, my great uncle retired to uh, the Philippines. For same reason. Yeah. You know, um, his money just goes a lot farther, and people are great. Food's great. Food you know, awesome. everything's fresh. He said. Yeah. He said most of the time when you eat, you know. The chicken you're eating was just killed. Yeah. And he's like, yeah. so he's eating better and being able to stay more active and he just likes it. So he spends about, I think, eight, nine months over there and then he comes back for a few months to the States, kind of. Yeah, you just can't drink the water. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, those it's weird how your money can travel that much farther in, a, in another country like that. Yeah. Um, I don't think I could ever do it, personally. If I did, it's going to be a Caribbean island. I, I could... <laughs> I don't know if I could live there, but I could definitely go back to yeah. spend a month of vacation. So when you were there, what did you guys do? Was it like a training thing? Or? Yeah, we went and trained. Uh, they had the uh, the Thai Marines, as they called them over there. And I'll tell you the freakiest thing ever is on a live fire range with those guys shooting, and then they call it ceasefire. And it's like something out of the movies. I see, you see little mama sons and everything start popping up out of the middle of where you were just shooting. People are popping up out of it, collecting up coming over and collecting all your brass and oh sh- you didn't collect stuff. your own brass no no they 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 collected all the brass and kept all the brass there that was wow. i guess payment for them okay uh, some of the creepiest bugs in my life i saw in thailand like centipedes that were like a foot long that just come crawling across and i don't know that i'm scared of centipedes i don't know enough about them but dude those are the freakiest looking things when they do like they the, bite you know what? I, I, can they? 
I would assume they'd have to be able to, right? I, I wasn't going to test the theory. Yeah, I don't uh, A me. bug that big that could pick up my own rifle and walk off. <laughs> I wasn't not going to. That's like, dude, it's yours. Know, I'm carrying, it a, 240, yeah, carrying yeah. a 249 saw, and this guy's walking out with an M60. And I'm like, no, that bug's a bad bug. Yeah. I'll leave him alone. Old Rambo gun. Yeah. They had the 60 while you're still in. Yeah. Damn, Damn M60 Echo 3. Look at you. Wow. Showing old your school. age. Yeah. Old school. Yeah, any iconic scene you can remember with uh, Schwarzenegger or with Rambo, it was a M60, guys. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a badass gun. Yeah. I had uh, the 249 Bravo. Um, was I wasn't a 249. I, like it wasn't assigned to me, but I was. I got to shoot. You know, I got uh, what do they call it? Certified in it. Yeah. It's a good gun. I carried the 249. Yeah, you carried the. I didn't the, get. The, I got the big boy version. <laughs> yeah, I didn't get the little bitty one that y'all yeah. got. I got that big monster yeah. that weighed a ton. Yeah, when we then got uh, then got an NJP for melting a barrel on one of them. <laughs> hey, you didn't call Runaway? No, <laughs> too busy. Staff Sergeant Gunny <laughs> sitting right behind, trying me, to tell you to stop, watching me as we got we got uh, four drums of ammunition just linked together. Me and three other guys are just holding it and walking it on in, and I'm just letting it go down. Oh my God. How hot did it get towards you? Uh, you know what? The heat towards us really didn't notice that bad because we were too in awe of watching the barrel. Cause you can start from, seeing the rounds come yeah, out. <laughs> you saw it go from black to orange, to red, to orange, to white. And then you're seeing the rounds just. Yeah. It's amazing. And then the end of the barrel going like this, and then it comes out the end of the barrel, and everything just kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. And then you're getting kicked. By, by, yeah. yeah. Hey. So it was it was a good time. Sorry, Gunny, couldn't hear you. It was it, I worth tell you it. What, it was worth it. Hell yeah. It was worth it. I try to tell people, like, they don't understand that the military can punish you however they want. Yeah. For whatever they want. For whatever they want. Because you are a. Your property. Your property. Your yeah. property. If you, if you want to know what slavery is like, join the service <laughs> back then. Oh, I bet. Yeah. yeah like that. Because I, your, your property. We went out. To, uh, I remember the first time I went out and I got a tattoo. And I came back and. Oh, it showed. My my day in the Corps, they didn't really care so much about short sleeve shirts. But in the long sleeve shirt, it couldn't show. If you stretched your arm out and the sh- shirt pulls up, you, could, you couldn't have anything showing. Yeah. Nothing on the neck, above the collar line, or anything like that. So I had all of mine hidden for it fairly well. Uh, a buddy of mine, about the time that Dust of Dawn came out with George Clooney and mm-hmm. uh, what's his face, um, Trejo. Yeah, Danny Trejo, and then uh, the director. Uh, oh yeah, who was the director? The, uh, the ugly looking dude. Not Scorsese. It's. Um... The one that did Pulp Fiction, right? Yeah. yeah. Damn it, I just watched the thing on him, too. Yeah. But anyways, so, yeah. you know, and Clooney's got that the tribal-looking neck. neck tattoo that goes all the way down his arm. So my buddy goes, while we're in Thailand, of all places, <laughs> finds a tattoo parlor. Very clean needles. Oh, yeah. And gets tattooed tribal. He tells the guy, I want tribal tattoos. So this guy tattoos these squares and shark teeth-looking designs all down him. And... He comes back and he's proud of this tattoo, and it's just the outline, and it's getting infected. Oh <laughs> like, Jesus! <laughs> well, he got an NJP for that because it went above the collar line. Apparently, the guy didn't understand not above collar. Ah, like that. But uh, okay. And then I heard nowadays because I remember when uh, actually when nine eleven happened, I was living in Louisville, Texas, and uh, my buddy was. Uh, Actually, that worked with me. Um, he was Arabic or Arabian or something from Middle Eastern. Yeah, Middle Eastern from over there. And his parents were freaking out because they thought something was going to happen to him. He's like, "No, I'm cool. So I'm with Steve. Nothing's going to happen. You know, what's yeah. going to mess with me?" And then so, and we he, he got a when on his way out to his truck, he got a few people that were screwing with him, but nothing serious. Anyways, after I saw 9-11, we saw that we watched the towers fall like that, and I was on the phone with the prior enlistment recruiter trying to get back in, and they denied me because of my tattoos. What the fuck? Like that, because they changed, Marine Corps changed the regulations where you couldn't have. I bet they were kicking themselves after that. Yeah. Because they couldn't, and I was, I mean, couldn't shit. find people. Yeah, and I was I was getting up there in age to pass that cutoff, so the chances were slim. Yeah. Like that, but I was ready to go back in. Yeah. I mean, that just 
Yep. You know, you're messing with, uh, you know, you're messing with my country. Now you're hitting me on my home soil and yeah, that ain't going to fly. Yep. I was, uh, I went in in 06, um, and it was, it was all stemmed from that. It was all part. I mean, that was part of it. Um, but yeah, that was a, that was a big deal. That made, that was one of the best recruitment videos ever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, was, uh, thanks for bringing it down. Dick. Now I'm thinking hey, about it. it. <laughs> Everybody has flashbacks to what they were doing. When I'm sitting there. I remember I was on, I was on campus and I'm, I see it hit the, the first plane. Yeah. I'm like, idiot. I was like, that traffic tower controller is going to get so much trouble. Oh, like, done. like done. yeah, like that's done. all I could think. And I was so naive, yeah. so naive at the time that at that point in my life that even when the second one came by, I'm like, they, something's wrong with the equipment. Yeah. They're like, like they're running into buildings and shit. Like that's how dumb I was. <laughs> as I just graduated high school <laughs> and uh, I had no idea. And then, then when they came down, then it was like, I got to get a job, make some money. I was like, you know, I got to find, I got to find some chicks that I can get lined up and get my little black book started. I, I you know, I can't yeah. go. And then, so I was, a, you know, I was still in, you know, party mode when I first got out, not really knowing what I had to do. And it wasn't until um, about 2000, 2002. Yeah, about 2002 when I figured it out. Okay. Because I tried going back to college. You know, I went to DeVry for computer engineering. I Um, remember the commercials. Yeah. And I had a buddy that was in telecommunications program up there. And we were going to start our own company. And, you know, we were going to do all kinds of stuff. And I was just like, I got tired. I was like, this is not me. Yeah. This this is too, this is just not me. I can't be indoors. I got to get out. So I went out and did uh, industrial radiography. Uh, x-ray and pipelines and buildings and water towers and stuff for people. And it was the welders that actually pushed me into well, that. I got to know real well that pushed me into building guns. Cause we got to talking about the military and you know, the M 16s and stuff like that. And they go, well, I've got this AR and I'd bring it to them and I clean it or I fix it or change it. And they're like, you know what? You should do this full time. Cause these things are awesome. And I was just, I'm like, okay. I mean, it was, something I knew and grew up with. It was nothing cool to me. It was just another yeah type deal. And uh, so I started, in my spare time, I started buying parts and putting these AR together for all these guys that I worked with. And that kind of, I told my dad about it, and he's like, well, won't you come uh, work for my master gunsmith, the guy that I go to who's a master gunsmith, and uh, learn from him. So I went and did that out in Midland. I moved back out to Midland for a couple of years, and, you know, my first experience in gunsmithing was scrubbing guns. Yeah. Scrubbing and cleaning, getting all the dirt and grime. So you were them. apprenticing. Yeah, I was apprenticing. And I worked for nothing. Yeah. You know, I, wor- I went to my dad's, uh, worked for my dad during the day. And in the evening time, I went over there and did nothing but scrub guns for him. And on the weekends, I was there scrubbing guns and learning what I could. And he you, finally, he he told, mia- yeah, he miyagi'd you. Yeah. And he told me, he goes, you know, this is the school I went to. You need to go to it. So. I checked it out, went up there. Um, it's Trinidad State Junior College in, you know, Trinidad, uh, Colorado, right there just above New Mexico. Yeah. Like that. And it's, when I was there, it was absolutely gorgeous. Like that, fell in love with it. Like that, and uh, so I, I made the decision, moved up there and went to school. I accepted into the school. And yeah. I walked in. They give you an entrance exam. To see how much you know. And there's guys that grew up around guns their whole life, knew it inside and out, knew all these little deals. Their dads were machinists or stuff like that. I knew nothing. I scored a zero. Really? A zero on my entrance exam. You thinking? Working this, around this, guns. This guy working around the M16 stuff. He's got to know something, right? Yeah. Totally different ballpark. Well, that was totally a worthless different. apprenticeship that you did. Like that. Well, I mean, I knew how to break down, but he didn't really tell me, you yeah. know, this part does this or that. He just, it was basically, I was paying my dues. I was, oh, he didn't Miyagi anything then. No, no. He what really an asshole. Didn't. No, he's a great guy. No, he's not. No, he was. He Don't was. give me that. No. I'm calling him out right now. What's yeah. his name? Well, he passed away. Oh, like that. damn yeah. it. So ass. <laughs> Foot in mouth. No, but he was. He was Rest a, in peace, but you were an asshole yeah. teacher. No, he, was, uh, he was a, he was a, 
I remember correctly, he was PD and his wife was sheriff. Okay. Or sheriff's deputy out in West Texas. And uh, he retired, did the gunsmithing thing. Yeah. And she was still doing that. And then he passed away not too long ago. It was probably maybe four or five years ago. Okay. Now that he's passed. Um, but I went to the school just because of him, you know, that's what I got. And I, I came out of that school and actually passed the final exit test. And it's really not, uh, has nothing to do with you're going to graduate or not. They just want to see where, where you came from. Yeah. Where your where knowledge, you yeah, yeah. Your knowledge base. How much did you learn? And at the end of the year, and they're ringing out all the scores like that. And they're like, well, the person who improved the most, but didn't score the highest, but had the, yeah, well, shit, you set the bar so low. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you just stack their numbers for them. Dude, that's, that's all I do. That's all I got. I'm a numbers guy. <laughs> right. But, uh, yeah, so it was it was pretty cool going out. And then uh, you really don't know or realize how much you've learned until you get out and start doing. Doing with, that with, Without somebody there going, okay, yeah, you need to do this. Here's the – I think you're on your own and you're thinking it through because there's – you can't cover – every single problem that you're going to encounter in a school setting. Yeah. Because there's just so many different variables out there. They just, there's just no way you can cover them. You'd be in school for the rest of your life and never doing anything. Yeah. And then, and man, just getting out and getting on your own, getting your feet wet and trying to make a living. It was, it was hard getting out. Uh, cause I, I was comfortable there and got to know things, got comfortable. And then you, Move down and you got to start all over. Yeah, got to build your base. Yeah, dang. Yep. So it was it was interesting. It was I mean, and so you knew when you were going to go to this school, you're like, this is my career path. This is oh, yeah. this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. Okay. You yeah. never considered police or fire or anything like that because that's a very easy normal transition for a lot of military. And you know, I had thought about that when I first got out. I was like, you know, I want to go be a Texas Ranger. You okay. Know, I, I want to be highway patrol. You know, I want to be out there. I want to be those guys. Writing tickets. Yeah, writing tickets. <laughs> yeah. Because I remember watching, uh, my dad used to let me drive Yeah. when I was in eighth, starting around the seventh and eighth grade. He used to let me drive from Midland to El Paso, uh, his truck, when we would go out there to visit his mom and dad, my grandparents out there. He'd let me, when we get out on the highway, he'd let me drive because straight lines. Yeah. Like that. And I remember this motorcycle just Low and biased, like we were standing still. And next thing you know, the state trooper, that's when they had the uh, Fox body Mustangs. Oh, yeah. And he comes just screaming by his lights going and all that. And I was like, man, I want to be that guy. Yeah. I want to drive that fast. Yeah. Like that. Catch and, the bad guys. Yeah. But uh, they were like, yeah, you got to have, you got to, yeah, you can, you know, your your military does you so many points towards like that, but you got to get some college, you got to get a bachelor's degree and like that. And I was like, oh, not doing school. Okay. Not going back to school. I hear you. Like that. This college wasn't my. I'm a. I'm. It's funny. I am not personally a fan of people needing to have a college degree to be a cop. You know, it's good to have it. It's a bonus. Yeah. But to have one to to make that mandatory because I'm telling you, I've worked with some of the best cops who had a high school education, and you can you could attest for the same thing in the military. You got these officers that think their shit don't stink because they got a degree and they're they, dumber than a box of rocks. Yeah, exactly. And, and then you got the guy next to you that can lead, you know, can make, get an Eskimo to buy an ice cube, you know, type thing. They're, yeah. they're that good at what they do. They know everything and they can lead, you know, leadership is a quality that you're not going to necessarily learn in college. No, I, I, leadership is definitely something that is you're ingrained and you're born with. It is not something you necessarily learn. You yeah. learn you learn how to maybe focus that leadership, how to build that leadership. You can learn that, but the actual I don't know, art of being a yeah. leader. It's, it's like social skills. Yeah, to it's me. just something that's you're born with. I, I, I find it very once you get to a certain part of your life, I find it very I don't want to call it impossible because I think everybody's capable of achieving the impossible, but Social skills are hard to gain once you've reached a certain point in your life. Yeah. Um, you get set. Y- yeah, you get set in your ways, and then I don't know what it is, but you see these most people that have really good social skills have leadership qualities to them. And they kind of go yeah. hand in hand. And um, I think that's important for police work 
And oh, most definitely. There's not a there's not a gauge to that. And you and I talked yeah. about a little story <laughs> earlier. Yeah. Oh. You, you want to bring that one up? You want to talk about that? You know, we can talk about that. Okay. We Before we dive into that. it, I want to I want to preface like the show is about education and learning. Hey, what happened? My screensaver came on. There we go. Um, it's about you will be the first person I've had on here that has a um, negative cop perspective on something. And it's not that you're anti-cop. And no, no, I, but let me let me say, interrupt you for just a second. For okay. saying that, that, that one incident, though, I've had numerous of others uh, where the interaction between myself and the local laws, law enforcement uh, officer at that time had been uh, with whatever department they were with when it happened – fantastic yeah like i mean i'm wholeheartedly I, I teach my kids you know if you get in trouble that guy wearing that uniform with that badge or you know like that that's the guy you go to yeah he'll keep you safe he'll protect you he'll he'll make sure you get back to yeah. mom and dad or but i want anybody that is in law enforcement and anybody that's thinking about law enforcement anybody that uh doesn't know what to think about law enforcement if they see this i want them to see i want them to hear your example because i will be the first to say like it's horseshit what some were doing or one was doing um, because they let their emotion get involved in a profession. Right. Um, and in police work, you have to, emotion's going to be there. We're human. I get that. I only give that latitude in the heat of the moment, not once that pressure's gone. Right. Once that's gone, we need to be able to step back. And if we don't recognize it in ourselves, if somebody gets past a certain point where they're still seeing red, it's your job is, is my partner to, to recognize that, hey, get back. Like, you're done with this. I got this. You need to cool off. Yeah. That, that's part of our job, to keep each other in check. So um, with that said, this will be our first real, like, that's kind of messed up. Yeah. So uh, I want people to learn from it. So go ahead with your story, sir. Okay. So, uh, and I got a lot of respect for some of these guys. <laughs> There's just only one. That, that, I got you. That, but uh, my wife and I, when we moved from Colorado, we moved to Flower Mound. And the apartment was going up on rent. So you lived out there yeah. other than just school? like you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, we lived, we lived up there because... I finished the school and I stayed there an extra year. Oh, okay. Up there, just, I'm I'm sorry to interrupt. I just no, I, no, 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 I didn't no. realize that. that's cool. Yeah. So we moved down um, to Flower Mound and you know started working gunsmithing. I was working. I started Defender Outdoors as a little gunsmithing deal for them. You know, helping them out. And those are a great group of guys out there. Um, and so, anyways, so we're doing that. And long story short, rent going up. We're figuring, you know. Let's buy a house. Well, obviously, on what I was making at the time, we're not living in Flower Mound. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, you get a 200-square-foot a, a house in Flower Mound, and it's going to cost you $400,000. Really? Oh, it's See, I, I'm Flower Mound's still ridiculous. terrible. I'm still terrible with cities in Texas. Yeah. I, if it's not Austin, Dallas, Fort Worth, Arlington, yeah. San Antonio, like the major cities. Yeah. I don't really well, see, Flower Mound's Flower Mound is actually really nice. I lo I love the area. Yeah. People are really. I'm nice. sure you do, but yeah. you ask anybody else from outside the state. Yeah. You ever heard of Flower Mound? They're gonna be like, No, where? Yeah. What? <laughs> yeah. But uh, so we moved down, and my wife had found a couple houses down in Crowley, and we went down there, and I was like, Oh, you know what? This is. It's south. It's it's closer. To mom and dad is to my mom and dad, and it's closer. You know, my, or my dad and his wife, and it's uh, puts us an hour closer drive down toward my mom and her husband's place down in uh, New Ulm, Texas. You don't call him dad? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so we closed on the house, bought the house, and moved in, and hadn't been there four or five months. Mm -hmm. like that so we're you know we're still new to the area kind of sketched i'm real i'm checking the neighbors out saying okay what kind of people are these really kind of yeah. getting the lay of the land in the area well i at the time i was also working a plumbing job so i'd been all day plumbing went down and now sarge and i had started 
our business. You know, defenders, okay. defenders on out the door that are in the back rear view mirror. Uh, I'm plumbing part-time, actually full-time plumbing, and then working for, you know, Sergeant and I trying to start up HRH, get it rolling. Okay. Like that. So I've been plumbing all day at HRH, come home. My wife is like, you know, I signed us up for this craft fair <laughs> deal to sell all this stuff down there at the rec center. Yeah. Uh, she yeah, goes, like, but I got the boys. They're tired. I can't go down there. Uh, can you go and do the tables for me? I was like, fine. <laughs> Damn it, woman. Yeah. So I go down, you know, being the good slave I am. I go, down, <laughs> I go down and watch these tables for my wife. And I'm talking to people and, you know, and it's getting late and I'm just dog tired. Get everything packed up and I'm heading back to the house. And it's after nine o'clock now in the evening. And uh, I'm just looking forward to getting some sleep. Yeah. Go inside. I'm getting ready to go take a shower. And I hear this boom, 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 boom on the front door. Or my wife heard it and she comes running in to get me. Somebody's pounding on the front door. So first thing I do, new neighborhood, not knowing anybody, all our lights are off because we're all, you know, getting ready. Which is universal language for anybody else. At least when I was growing up, if the lights are off, don't don't bug these people. Like nobody's either home or they don't want. It's going to turn around really bad for you. Yeah, they don't want none. Yeah. So uh, I go to the door, you know, light on, kick open the door, or, you know, pull the door open, and I've got, and it's just some kids. Yeah. So I felt, like, just, like, worse than dog shit. Yeah. You know, for pulling a gun on kids, yeah. of all things. And it's the last thing I would ever do. Yeah. And so I put the gun away, like that, and I'm talking to them. And they're like, well, we kicked our ball into the backyard, and like that. And I said, okay, I understand. I said, please do not come over here if the lights are off wait until the morning yeah when it's light like that do me that favor and he goes oh yeah sure 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 so they go back home i throw the ball over the fence for them don't think anything of it i go get in the shower apparently they told mom mom didn't like it mom's like well he's a racist because they were hispanic she, ah. and I, they told her that i was a white guy she automatically assumed that i was a racist okay even though my kid's godmother is hardcore Hispanic. I mean, just like she is the essence of what Hispanic, you know, the yeah. Mexican culture. She's beautiful. She's smart. She's like that. She uh, teaches, she knows Spanish and English and a couple other different languages. Yeah. And she loves my kids to death. And that's the greatest thing in the world. And her, her, she, her and my wife are real good friends. So anyways, now I digress. So now <laughs> yeah. I'm in the shower. I'm getting, uh, getting ready to get out of the shower. And my wife comes running back in there. Someone's pounding on the front door. So now I'm thinking, drunk uncle. Yeah. Drunk dad, drunk brother, drunk uncle. So one of those scenarios. Yep. Didn't even think that it would be the cops. Yeah. All right. So I go to the front door again. Now I'm just in my sleep my sleep shorts and like that. I flip the light on. I look out the peephole just to see if I'm going to see anything. I don't see anything. I pull the door open and, you know, I've got my gun up. And there's four cops lined up right there in that doorway. Ooh. And I was immediately saw them and it's clear chamber, dropped the dropped a gun down on the ground, you know, dropped mag, everything else out, hands up in the air. They put me in cuff, take me out. And it's always the smallest guy that starts the most shit. Right. Always the smallest. The big guy that I had dead to rights like that. And I'm thankful that I never put squeeze that trigger off because they're yeah. the good people that would have gone down that day and it would have been ugly. Yeah. Like that. And, uh, but, uh, the big guy was, I don't remember his name, but, uh, man, he was just, I just remember his demeanor and the way it was kept me from getting escalated, escalated yeah. in, in my actions. And, uh, his partner was all up in my face. Oh, I was in the court too. And we don't do, you know, we don't do that. Da, 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 da. And I was, the only thing I can think of in my head, I'm thinking is like, dude, if these cuffs come off, I'm kicking your ass. Yeah. And then I'm going to drag you all around this city. Yeah. And, that, and uh, the big guy's like, no, 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 just calm down. Stay over here. He's pushing this guy away. Well, the guy goes, well, I'm going to go talk to the wife. Now I'm getting mad. Yeah. And beyond the point where I can control it. Cause I'm starting to shake. And, um, he's over there and I can hear him just grilling my wife, just all up in her shit. What type of stuff was he saying? Like that. Uh, something about taking me to jail that I'd never see the light of day again because I pulled a gun on a cop and that, you know, he could ruin the, 
everything for us and yeah. all that. And she's just, you know, she's tired. She's got, we just had a son not too long ago. <clears throat> My oldest son is still just a, you know, just a toddler. He's, you know, sleeping. Yeah. And so she's freaking out. She's trying to fight back tears, but they're coming out anyways. And he finally leaves her alone and she goes back inside like that. And uh, they're, I guess, watch lieutenant or whatever was out there. And, you know, he's talking shit to me because he doesn't know what the fuck's going on. Right. He's just protecting his guys. And he's, you know, he's taking care of his own. And that's what you're supposed to do. Understandable. And the big guy's like, well, you want to give us a statement? I was like, man, I'll, I'll be more than happy. Because they don't know all this. Have they no don't idea. know what led all up the, for you reacting the way you did. Yeah, all they know is they got a call from a woman that I pulled a gun on their kids. Yeah. Like that. And that's all, and I'm sure that's all she told them. Yep. And that, so they don't know anything. And I don't hold it. Don't I don't hold it against the mom. The mom. Because you don't know what the kids told. You don't and know how they I, told it. Right. Yeah. And, you know, and she's protecting hers. Yeah. Like that. So I don't hold it against her. I don't feel any ill will towards them or the kids because kids are kids. They're going to do what they're going to do. Yeah. They're going to say what they're going to say. Like that. I don't hold anything against the mom because she's doing what's that. Uh, the one cop that was in that whole night that I praised was that that bigger cop that, that was down there. He was a credit to that department down there. Yeah. Like that for sure. That's awesome. And uh, so I wrote what, my I wrote did my he, statement and all that. What did he do right? I'm sorry to cut you off, but what did he do right? What what he's about him? Out of all the things, I remember him being level headed and just calm. His whole demeanor, he was ice the whole time, mm-hmm. and I could tell he was working the angles. He was looking at everything. Okay, did this happen? Did make cause this happen? What happened in between those two points? And how did it get to there to here? And he was wanting to know, figure it out before he made a judgment. Yeah. Of course. And he knew I wasn't going anywhere. I'm in, I'm sitting in handcuffs in the back and being as old as I am now, I'm not as flexible as I used to be. Yeah. Like that. Sorry, ladies. Like that. <laughs> like that. Um, but so he knows I'm not going anywhere yeah. and I'm not definitely not doing anything. He's, he's got, you know, a hundred, 120 pounds on me easy. You yeah. know, I'm, Pushing 180, 185, and you know, he's easy 210, 220. Okay, he's a big boy. So he's a big dude. You know, he's yeah. he's up there. Uh, so he wasn't worried about me. Yeah. Like that. But he stayed calm. Yep. Like that. And kept me calm. Yeah. Even with his little loud mouth partner running off at the mouth. Yeah. That was able to calm me down and keep me going, okay, hey, I need to get myself out of this so that I can protect my family. Yeah. Like that. And, uh, so I wrote my statement down for him like that. And then they let, they let me go and let me out. And of course the little one's still running his mouth like that. And then the next day the detective calls me up and I'm sitting there talking to the detective. And, uh, I do rem- it's, I think it's the detective white like that. Great. He's a really nice guy. Great detective. He was super nice on the phone. Very informative, very helpful. Wasn't accusatory. Wasn't, leading me in, you know, trying to lead something on or, you know, do the questioning type thing that you see in the movies and the TVs right. where they're trying to catch yeah. you. Oh, well, you said 11 o'clock and yeah. now you're saying 12 or, you know, like that. Yeah. Like, Dude, come on. And it was none of that. Mm-hmm. I mean, very professional, very nice guy. I know. And then with my business partner being retired PD, mm-hmm. you know, I'm sitting there talking to him about it. He's like, dude, I wouldn't worry about this or that. Just, you know, you gave a statement, you know, if it's the truth, it's the truth, and you don't have to worry about it. Like that. So here we are. And they didn't they didn't pursue no, to try to press no, any charges. No or charges like or nothing. They they dropped everything, so, left it up. Yeah. Detective White even contacted me back after everything was all said and done. He goes, you know, he goes, this might be one of those really good times to introduce yourself to your neighbors and get to know them so they know that you're not a racist. So they know that you're not that kind of person. Yeah. And, and I thanked him for his opinion. I said, you know, I value your opinion on that, and I thank you for it. And I said, I'll take that into consideration. Yeah. No, I haven't been over there. I thought, I'll just let sleeping dogs lie and let the time, yeah, you know, time heal itself and do what it needs to do. Yeah. Like that. But, uh, I mean. I'm a big proponent of getting to know your neighbors. Yeah. Like, I, I, we get Christmas presents for all of our immediate neighbors. We, we talk and – it, it, like if somebody moves in the neighborhood, you know, yeah. you know where I live. I live on a circle. Right. This street is a circle. So yeah. I know just about everybody that lives on this street. Yeah. And, uh, and the only reason I do that is because I've been a cop. 
Yeah. And I've seen most things could be avoided if that relationship had been started. Oh, most definitely. But you're, I, I in your, your case, it, yeah. the damage had been done. Yeah. So yeah. I, I get where you're going. But, yeah, we're real good, you know, and we know m- most of the people in our neighborhood, you know, the lady that lives to the left and to the right and across mm-hmm. the way, we all of us know each other. Our kids have all played together, you know, out in the street and stuff. Yeah. And even got in trouble together with throwing the little poppers on the 4th of July. They're not even firecrackers, but we got in trouble by Crowley PD <laughs> like that for popping them. Because oh they thought God. they were firecrackers. And we're like, okay, hey, you know, I'm not going to argue with you. Yeah. I thought, you know, I don't feel like going to jail on the 4th of July for arguing with the cop right. over a firecracker. Jeez. So the, the point that I want to point, the point that I want to point out, the example I want to point out, let's put it that way, is um, the situation could have been handled and de-escalated. Because let's, let's say you weren't in cuffs yet and somebody's approaching your wife. You're on your own property. In the grand scheme of things, you were right doing what you did because it's your property. What you knew and your perspective on things, you potentially had a have to protect my home situation. And it takes officers time to navigate that. Yeah. And like I said, in the heat of the moment, you point a gun at me, I will tell you right now as an officer, I'm going to be amped up. And you know oh, that. That's, that's instant. And yeah. For that, for that. And that's why I said that uh, I'm grateful for one that I never pulled the trigger. I'm grateful too that the cop that was first in line, that larger guy, never pulled a trigger. Yeah, never pulled his weapon, and stayed yeah. calm. And I'm glad that I was able to recognize that uniform as quickly. And yeah, that badge and knowing that hey, yeah, target recognition. Yeah, Marine you know, Corps took over. Whoa, hey, good yeah. guys. You know. Yep. Like that, and I got I got mad respect for all, you know any law enforcement officer to do this job nowadays. Yeah. You guys, uh, y'all couldn't pay me enough. Yeah, you could not, because I'm not going to take shit from somebody. Yeah, like and that. and and that's the thing is you you had the great example of the guy that was helping you out during the whole situation, and then you've got the polar opposite of the guy that's trying to amp things up. And this is why I preach about social skills so much is as an officer, and I want, I don't give a shit if it pisses off other cops or not. What you say and do, if you're emotionally wrapped up in it, makes a difference. And now that impression, now luckily your impression of law enforcement has been consistent with being on on the side of them. But that one officer, if he's done that to you, how many other people has he done that to? Exactly. No one's putting him in check. And if they are, like, it's because he hasn't necessarily violated any rules. And this is that weird area. This is that gray area as a cop. Like, he's over there chastising your wife. What, you know, what if you weren't in cuffs? And then you, you're defending your wife. Yeah. If I, if, and that's the, that's the thing I think about and, you know what my I mean? My wife and I have talked about it. If, yeah. You know, she knows if I wouldn't have been in cuffs, knowing my personality. You would have an assault charge an officer. Yeah. I'd, I'd, yeah. I'd be I'd be done. And almost everybody, especially if they had body cams on at the time or whatever, would maybe, after hearing the whole story, be like, you know what? That cop had it coming. Yeah. Because he's running his mouth. You got to have a purpose behind the stuff you're saying. Yeah. I, I will say this. Now, one thing I didn't get to tell you earlier when we were at the store because we got distracted and stuff like that. My wife took a self-defense class by those exact two cops. <gasps> no shit. And she approached the both of them and talked to them, and they remembered like that. And the little guy actually apologized to my wife. Okay. Like that. Um, and like I said, time, you know, time heals, time tells. Yeah. Crows wisdom through, you know, yeah. age and stuff like that so but i want lessons to be learned from yeah. but and i get it i think it would have gone completely different if i didn't have a weapon in my hand yeah it would have gone there would have been no amped up and like that and i so that cop getting amped up it may or may have not been his because of his own the way he is the way yeah. his makeup is but i think a lot of that had to do with the fact too that i had a gun in my hand i get it like that. So, and if I, only thing I could tell anybody nowadays is, look, if somebody, if a law enforcement officer tells you, hey, do this, just do it. 
Yeah. You know? The court is where you fight. Eat, eat, eat yeah. your humble pie out there on the road. I don't care how big and badass you think you are uh, or really are or whatnot. Yeah. No cop's worth fighting over. A, no cop's worth, you know, it's not worth getting in a fight with a cop. It's not worth trying to, you know, I'll take his life or anything yeah. like that over. These guys got You guys have to do a job that is far more stressful than anything that I'll ever face now as a civilian. Yeah. You know, and so. I, I try to tell people, I'm like, listen, like, if you kill a cop with kindness, when you go to court, if, if you're justified, if, if, if the reason you would have fought with them on the side of the road or whatever it is, if you kill them with kindness at the moment and then you go to court and you were completely right, you are going to own them. You are going to own that officer and maybe you'll make a payday out of it, you know, it, whatever. If that's what you're into, cool. But the thing that I want... I, I hate when cops mess up, but I love it. It's a double-edged sword. Yeah. So, like with the officer that fucked up with you, I'm hoping something good came out of that training-wise. I want people to hear this and hear your story yeah. and hear me say as a, a 17-year officer, hey, that cop screwed up. Whether justified he the moment. Once that moment was over, once the heat of the moment was over, the chastising and the, the amped upness and all that stuff and the threats, the empty threats, basically. Uh, what's the end goal of that as an yeah. officer? I want I want an officer to answer that to me because there's no end goal there. You're not going to accomplish anything. Uh, and you've got to be able to turn it on and turn it off. Yeah. And, and that's hard. And a lot yeah. of people, especially civilians, military personnel who are now civilians but not never been officers kind of know but don't really know. Mm-hmm. And they won't and, admit that. And when they won't admit that. In yeah. general, generalized. And then people who've never been military, who've never been in law enforcement, will never know. Yeah. What it is to try to turn that adrenaline and that amp, get that amped rush turned off. The only it's tough. I'm yeah. not I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say that it's easy that oh you should be able just to at a yeah. snap of a finger do it. I know it's tough. You know? Yep. Uh so I don't I don't hold the the ego in me, the marine in me, yeah. would like take that guy out in the backyard and walk him up and down side and side, <laughs> you know, for doing that to my wife. But yeah, you know, being the the wiser of that too, like that, I don't hold it against. I don't hold anything against him. Yeah, it's that. it's it, for me as an officer. It's one of those. It's one of the reasons I started the show. I want, I want us. Cause there's a lot of cops that watch this. It's yeah. it's actually quite impressive humbling to me and if there's any female cops if you catch me speeding i drive an expedition <laughs> like that with hrh all over it feel free to use those batons you know you put me in handcuffs you put the pink fuzzy stuff around it and then use your you know i will submit oh uh, my god don't let my wife find out though oh my god you're gonna get so much trouble <laughs> i'm always in trouble <laughs> right I, I live in trouble um but yeah i just i want people to learn from good examples bad examples um him overreacting is a bad example, and I also want to say we're cops, we're human. Do I think he needs to be fired? No, no. not necessarily. Can he learn from it? Sure. I think is a any time a cop screws up, that's what I look at first. Is it salvageable? Is it something yeah. that we he, he can eat some humble pie, eat some crow, and come back stronger? Yeah, cool. I hope I hope that's the case. Um, just like when you melted a barrel, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you got your ass handed to oh, you yeah. and you came back probably even 10 times better than Marine. Yeah. And that's what happens. That's what screwing up does. It, it helps you become better. And, um, I just hope this younger generation learns that. Yeah. These new guys come. Yeah. We need, I know everybody's talking about defunding and getting rid of this and that. And I hope that never comes yeah. to complete fruition because, the average person, like I said, who's never been there, doesn't know it, can't see it because they just, they believe all the BS that's flowing in and out there. Yeah. We would be in a world of absolute shit if it weren't for you guys. I think I think with the the few places that have tried this defunding thing, that it, it's all reversing real fast mm-hmm. because they realize like it's actually the exact opposite of what you need. Yeah. In my opinion, you need more money. You know, it's just, think about it like growing a plant. Police, frontliners, 
they're your roots. Yep. You got to water the roots. Take care of them and everything else will blow up. Economy, everything. If you take care of that part. And I, I'm not going to sit here and say that I could grow a city or know how any of that stuff goes. I'm not. That's not my skill set. But in my experience in this, in this world, um, you take care of the roots of anything, everything else grows. Yeah. So take care of the base and, and, and businesses like yours will flourish yeah. because people, if they feel safe, they're going to come. If they feel safe, they're going to come to that city. And uh, I'm not saying you got to stack your police numbers because <laughs> just having more cops necessarily doesn't make you safe. It may give the perception of safety. I think uh, maybe some better training for you guys. Hell yeah. I like that for yeah. sure. Yeah. Well, definitely I've seen a... Not to bag on anybody, but I've I've seen some really poor shots. Yeah, <laughs> some web, poor weapons yeah. handling. Yeah, I am not a great but, shot. I, I will be the first to admit it. But I have the opportunity and the luxury. I can go down to the range whenever I want and get better. And I hold myself to a really high standard too. When I say I'm a bad shot, if I line up on the line against ten guys randomly from my same department, I'm probably going to be in the lower half uh, of average. But when it comes to shooting, I'm still shooting in the high 90s, which right. is, you, you see it all the time from people from all walks of life. High 90s is not common. That's pretty good. So if I shoot a 95, 96, like my boys and girls that I work with will look at me and be like, come on, Levine, step it up a little bit. And and I get that. Yeah. But on an average, I'm actually doing really well. So... Um, with what you said, you know, it all comes down yeah. to money, time, uh, training availability. Better training. We need y'all better yeah. weapons for one. Because, man, some of the stuff, like, kind of to, to regress a little bit, let's go back in time. Uh, I remember L.A. County Sheriff's Department. We used to get to do ride-alongs. Went to, did a ride-along with those guys. When you were a right, Marine. Or, yeah, when I was in the oh, Marine okay. Corps. And uh, we did a ride-along. Uh, I remember my squad leader at the time, I was just—I was a young private. He got in, uh, just got actually just got promoted to private first class, and the corporal, my squad leader, um, he was actually wanting. He had applied to go to L.A. County Sheriff's Department out there because he loved California, wanted to stay out there, and wanted to be a cop. Yeah, like that, and you know that's kind of like the pinnacle of, I guess, police out there. Where at the time was L.A. County Sheriff's Department. That's where you wanted to be. And uh, so he did that, but we did ride-alongs anyways. And I remember seeing an, uh, a, uh, I don't know, a call one night, and I, we had to stay back because of us being, you know, being in the car with the guys that we weren't allowed to be up there close, but they were watching. We remember hearing on the radio and seeing it that uh, some guy that was whacked out on PCP or something like that that was causing trouble, and they had surrounded, and they were trying to take him down, and he brandished a firearm, and they unloaded on him. Did he have clothes on uh, yeah, I think he was clothed. I don't. Okay. I didn't get to go. Normally, up there. when you deal with the PCP guys, yeah, they're naked. they're doing some weird stuff. But yeah. Uh, yeah, but they unloaded on him, and I remember. Uh, so you saw it happen? Uh, well, we heard it. We were within hearing distance. I didn't. Okay. I wasn't close enough to where I could actually see what was going on. But you knew you could hear the shots, and yeah, you knew that when you heard that 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 yeah. that, 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 that was not just one gun going off. That was a whole bunch of pistols, and I'm like, there's got to be a better way than you know. 15 yeah. guys unloading a, a gun. I get it. Everybody wants to get their trigger time. Everybody's like, wants to take them down. But uh, you, you got to have some, you know, you got some awareness of your surroundings. And I think if they're all unloading, you know, who's to say that some guy's not, a, there's not a group of guys over the back of the hill and he's just a decoy and they're going to come yeah. out. Especially nowadays, you guys have got, yeah. y'all have got a lot to worry about. Yeah. Like that, but then so. the argument's going to be, and I can tell you from the police perspective is, this guy's pulling a gun. Yeah. Do I wait for it to be pointed at me? Do I wait for it to be pointed at you? What do I do? I kind of, I, I get yeah. that. And it's hard. It is hard. But, man, for I just remember hearing all those shots go off. I was like, man, there's got to be, y'all have got to have a, a better weapon system, better platforms and yeah, stuff to use. Yeah. We got a lot of stuff out there now, um, 40 millimeter uh, bean bag. Well, it's not a bean bag. It's a foam grenade basically it's like a you know <laughs> it's just dude they're gnarly I've, I've i've seen them train with them uh gino guy i've had on here swat dude 
Uh, they carry those. The shotgun, shotgun bean bags hurt. I've been hit with one of those. Oh, have you I really? Think, oh, man, they suck. Oh. They suck. They will I, bruise. I don't think I'd volunteer for that training. Yeah, I'm no. not getting hit with that. I've been I've been tased. Been uh, tased. Pepper sprayed. OC sprayed. Uh, got bean bagged. Uh, that's the only thing I haven't been is shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Luckily enough, you know, knock on wood, I it's, have not been shot. It's one shot, of the funniest things, like, because when you're going through the academy, they're like, you know, yeah, you got to be pepper sprayed, tased, and you're like, why? Why do I need to get that yeah. done? And they're like, well, you need to show that, one, you can fight through it, because if you pepper spray somebody, overspray. That happens, and it's happened to me. Um, but then I'm like, okay, so why do I got to tase people? Why do I got to get tased to tase people? And they're like, well, because if you ever have to testify – in court, you can say you know what it's like and all this stuff. I was like, I don't have to do that if I have to shoot someone. You're going to make me get shot by a gun so I can right. say, well, I shot him. I know what it's like. And that's, that is a dumb argument. So officers out there, if you're using the argument, like, uh, don't. don't use no. that one. No, leave that one to go. Because the first like, thing my smart ass is going to do and be like, well, what, do I got to get shot by a gun? No. So why do I got to shot by a taser? Just to use it? That not make any sense. <laughs> Yeah, tasers. I'm a big fan of tasers. Now I love. Tasers. I say that in the last, let's say eight years, I used it once, and it worked. Yeah. It worked perfectly. We used to. We used to, <laughs> I remember we used to go to gun shows and get those handheld tasers. Oh, like you know, the, yeah, yeah. That the, don't really the stun do. the drive yeah, stun the, guns. Yeah. yeah, and we'd go back and they hurt, but oh man, the, some of them they'll burn you. They'll burn you. Yeah, yeah. like yeah, that. Absolutely. Uh, and we used to get. We used to get hammered and then start going around tasing each other. Yep. Like that. So, you know, you yep. start with shirt on. Next thing you know, you've got a bunch of guys running around shirt, shirts off and yep. alcohol in one hand and a handheld taser in the other. Yep. Sticking now, each other, you know. I can't confirm or deny because I am still in the United States Air Force. But when I was active duty and we had tasers, I will say that maybe or maybe not they had a couch in, in the – the missile alert facility that we stayed at. You know, you'd stay out in the prairies for five days and guard the nukes. And uh, they had these couches in the, like, common area. And it was like a put-together couch. Like the, I don't know what you call those, like where they would all attach to each other, but you could disconnect them and have a, a chair over here right, type right. thing. Yeah. So in between, you could you could reach your arm through from behind. And so... I'm I'm just saying I heard that uh, some people would take their taser and drive stun it, you know, instead of shooting, shooting in it, it, they would drive stun it, it and, yeah. and get you on the back of the arm while you're sitting on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> I if if we have time, oh dude, we got plenty. We're only at an hour forty five. Oh, we got plenty. Of time yeah, and this time. normally two three hour podcast. So, so my wife, big time volleyball player, coached volleyball. Really? Like How that, tall is she? Like that. Uh, Crap, you're gonna get me in trouble for this one. I think she's five eight, five nine. Okay. She's not very tall. Yeah. Not that tall well, enough. Compared to you. Yeah. You're six two. But she had a tens unit because she used to, she used to do the pads like that. And sitting one night up in the dorm, she got bored, decided to play said tens units pads in certain areas and start to crank up and see what happened. So Okay. We had a lot of fun with that tens Dang. unit. So let me tell you, if you put them on your head and you turn it up, you will make faces. That you didn't know. That you didn't know you could make. <laughs> yeah, That's awesome. It, it will. It will. I used to play this drinking game, and it, I don't know. I, and it doesn't help for libido. I'm yeah. just saying that. Oh, is really? A, that is a myth. It does not make the libido better. Oh, okay. That That's good to know. Yeah. Well, I played this game, and it everybody had a controller. or uh, It kind of looked like a joystick type thing, and it was connected to this little base. And I... I can't remember why, but if you were like the last one to, to click, a light would come on, and it was a reaction thing. Right. Last one to hit, jolted. I remember that. And, dude, that wasn't like a, it wasn't like a a little jolt. It no, was it, like a whole, almost whole body lockup yeah. in a sense. Now, you're not going to fall over, but you're like, oh, and you can't let go. Yeah. And it was gnarly. I was, <laughs> it was a fun drinking game, though. Yeah. Dumb. I think I remember that one. Dumb kids. Yeah. But you know, you're talking. That was way back in the day. That was yeah. back. That was back before all the PC stuff started. Happening. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. back when lawn darts were actually lawn darts, and you could take somebody out with them. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, sir. So, 
we went we, we talked about your your law enforcement issue um and everything worked out for for the better and i'm glad and i think there's some things that can be learned from that um i want to we got you know we'll say we got another 45 minutes uh ish yeah. i want to get into your your skill your oh, your craft it. here so you brought a bunch of things now i did bring some goodies uh i want to remind everybody this is hrh combat arms and coatings and uh this is the master gunsmith this is the guy that would be working on your weapons and uh making them do all the cool things that they do now one of the things that paul specializes in is seracoding so first thing we have is you guys you don't just seracoat guns oh we do all we're getting into all kinds of stuff i yeah. mean guns are only so far you can't do the same trick all the time yeah like that so you know, gun guys need to drink. You, what better to drink your alcohol out of while you're shooting out at the range or on your farm than a Yeti that's been custom seracoated by Sarge? Yep. Uh, Texas flag, of yeah. course. Yeah. So take a look at that. I'm going to hold this in front of the camera, try to get some good angles on that. Yeah. He, is, he is definitely a master of his craft as well. So th this is the first time I've seen, I walked into the shop today uh, to pick up the camera y'all donated, and this was actually a fresh job that was sitting in your, I don't know what that's called, the heater? Is it a, a, The oven. It's an oven? Yeah. 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 And uh, I saw this and instantly was like, oh my God, that's so cool. I like that. Now- And yeah, um, we've been actually, we've actually been doing Yeti cups for a while. Yeah. So. Oh yeah. I so remember. We've um, done mine and my wife's and stuff before we started. Uh, so what you guys could do for me, if you need a project to just, we'll do some more, because everybody that comes here usually sits down and drinks some whiskey. Right. Right. So if you could do a uh, HRH combat paint job. Then my, because these patches they, they they show, but they, they yeah, but they they don't do it justice. Like oh, we do, we'll do a uh, do some do some. I'll give you the Yetis to do. I don't. Yeah, I we'll, mean, we'll, we'll give you. A, we'll hook you up. Yeah, just we'll, do we'll some, some some branding. You know, because yeah. uh, I I mean I I got unapologetic, which is a Second Amendment uh, push from Chad Prather, um, Sergeant Viola, uh, Alex Viola. This is uh, my buddy. His podcast just posted today. Um, nice. He was a Green Beret. Oh, uh, awesome. awesome. And uh, he fell. Uh, I think he was killed by an IED, I believe. But they started a, a foundation um, uh, basically to promote and help, you know, military families and stuff like that that go right. through the same thing. That's awesome. And uh, most of their stuff is surrounded by car shows, classic cars. Right. Because uh, Alex owned a old Chevelle. Yeah. And we yeah. do well, we do car parts as well. Yes. Like that. so. And that that's what I was trying to lead into yeah. is that yeah. you guys. Yeah, we started doing car parts. We've done uh, we've done headers uh, for some guys, some turbo pipes, valve covers, all your brackets and stuff. Yeah. Um, oh, shit. I remember you guys had parts splayed out all yeah. over the place we've actually got a guy that's having a sarge got all the details on it and i talked to the guy briefly on the phone but uh he's got a custom truck that gas monkey garage is actually working on and oh we've got some of the billet parts uh the pedals and stuff in our shop that we're very cool gonna cerakote for him nice like that so i mean gas monkey's done, big yeah that's yeah. a big company yeah and we've cool. done you know we've done trim for people that have brought us some uh trim you know some chrome trim pieces that they want to save yeah off their uh classics and all that that we've clear coated and all that to keep the yeah to keep that chrome polish from messing up on them what's the uh, turnaround time let's say i wanted to get something seracoated does it i mean i'm sure it fluctuates if it's a gun and specialty it's going to take right longer. yeah we got we got different times the normal stuff like uh my sig there uh just for simple two color three color job something that's not very elaborate or over the top you know, you're about three to four weeks. Now, we talked about this gun when Sarge was on here, but yeah. uh, you're the one that, that did it, designed it, and all that stuff. Um, well, funny story, that's actually a trade. What? Actually a trade. I bought a, I'm a, I'm a huge Glock guy. I love Glock pistols. Amen. Point that. And uh, I also like SIG pistols. They, they're they uh, definitely um, an equal in my eyes to the Glock. And uh, a good friend of mine, who's also a customer, had that had bought that pistol, and was wanting a bunch of stuff done to it, did, like that. And I had that Glock, uh, a Gen Five Glock 19, 
that I had bought. And I wasn't real thrilled with the Gen 5. There's just something about the Gen 5. And maybe I just need to get some time to get used to it. But I'm not real crazy about it. Okay. Favorite Gen is Gen 3 and Gen 4. Love those guys. That was a Gen that's, 3, I believe. Yeah, that's a Gen 3 um, with I, the large. The yeah. large. 4 is my favorite. Yeah. Um, I, I, I say that because I haven't used a 5. Yeah. But It's just something about the 5 that throws me. I think it's the Ambi uh, slide release and all that that's on there. The, that uh, throws me off. Gotcha. But anyway, so I traded him that uh, Glock to help him out with his, he was running a charitable deal. So I said, I got, I got a brand new Glock. If you want it, instead of having this used gun uh, that you bought, let me give you a brand new one and I'll take that one from you. Okay. Like that. So we traded straight up like that. And then I got to looking around. I said, what can I do with that? Cause Sarge will tell you, I can't leave a gun that the fact that that gun has been that color scheme for this long is amazing. Yeah. Cause usually, I mean, my Glock 17 was at least 17 different colors inside of two months. Nice. Like that. And, uh, but anyway, so I, I got onto this, found the trigger, um, on it, did some little bit of slide work, not a whole lot on it. So I wanted to keep it carryable and not too bad. And then, uh, I found the standoff design device for it because you see, People now are getting a lot better trained, especially the underbelly elements, the underside of society elements are getting a lot more brazen in grabbing firearms Mm -hmm. to keep them from going off. Everybody knows a semi-automatic. If you take it out of battery, that's it. Yeah. Like that. So I figured, what better thing could I do? And I found this company. I actually bought this through HK Parts, the standoff device on that through HK Parts. Which and we're talking about this part here. Right. Everybody's looking. So if someone comes up and tries to press their hand or try to grab the firearm, it keeps it from going, from them being able to take the firearm out of battery. Like that on there. Yeah. Uh, and then you got the carbide tip glass breaker on the end, which I'm dying to try out. Yeah. I just, I just don't want to go to jail or get a ticket for trying it in a parking lot and on somebody's car. Right. Uh, so, but, so if you, if right now, I'm, after we leave here, like that, if, you need assistance. If you've locked your keys in the car or your dog <laughs> or your yeah. kid's toy or something like that, and you, you need to get it out, I'll be more than willing to drive out of my way to come yeah. try this out to see if so, I can get into your car with it. So any of you uh, guys out there that are not very weapons trained, I am not by any means a firearms instructor, but I will tell you this. Do not try to break glass with your finger on the, on the, the switch there, no. all right? Yeah, Please no. don't do that. No. And also be aware if you go to break the glass, because I know some of you dummies have it at the end of your knife. You've seen those ones. Oh, yeah. I actually have one in the truck. <laughs> you don't need to use it like a hand hammer, because if you don't have a glove on, your hand's going to go through the glass. Yep. So grab your baton or, or a stick or whatever it is. <laughs> if you use it on the end of your knife and just tap it, boom, just like that, like a, a, a yeah. hammer and a nail. That that will break the glass. Don't need a hard don't need a hard slam on that. I've dude. seen too many officers try to take. N- never this. I've never seen that on an officer's gun. Yeah. But I've seen too many officers take that knife and get like this and yeah. punch I think the y'all glass. Should, I think honestly, I think the PD should have y'all have those on there. There's nothing better. Yeah, that's a sweet sweet have, little piece. Have a standoff device yeah. to keep somebody from taking y'all out of battery. To take, taking y'all I out will of say fire. my department's very good at aftermarket, or I shouldn't say aftermarket, but just a plethora of options. Right, uh, you can have a Sig, you can have a Smith and Wesson, you can have um, a Glock. You, you know, you, there's all these different brands that you can. Have. It's got to be a nine, a forty five, or forty somewhere in there. But um, right. as long as there are armorers for it, you can use it. So it's yeah. kind of cool, but as far as the aftermarket stuff goes, I don't know what the liability and all that stuff. They yeah, I hear I hear a lot of different things coming in. Cause we get a, you know, of course we we do a lot for the PDs. Yeah. Right? So I don't I don't care if you're in the DFW Metroplex or even on the other side of the United States. If you're law enforcement and you send me something, you're going to get a discount and you're going to get my absolute best attention to it. Yeah. Is what I would do with anybody's project. Um, we like to give you guys. A little extra, you know, give y'all a discount that we don't offer to everybody. Yep. Like that. Just a, you know, a little thank you for, you know, what you yeah. do and, you know, shit. Us. The last project I had y'all do for me was my 300. And I had asked Sarge, like, you know, this is what I have to spend. I told him, yeah. like, outright, this is what I got to spend. Here you go. Take my money. Yeah, I remember and that. Uh, it went over yeah. and he ate it. 
Yeah. Like he was like, yeah, that's what I told you. And I was like, dude, I'll, I'll get more if I can. I was like, but like literally like this is all my wife's letting me use. Yeah. That's what I got. And, uh, it just ended up coming out a little bit more than he anticipated, but which happens occasionally. Well, and, for, uh, for you younger guys out there that are wanting to get a really nice weapon, call the shop. I've got the secret on how you can get what you want to get. If you're married, get what you want to get and stay out of trouble with your wife. Really? I have the ultimate secret. Okay. I like that. I like that. So you got to call the shop. Like okay. We're not going to do it on the podcast. We won't do it here. Yeah. Here. I don't want to. you got to call the shop. Yeah. At least call, find out what yeah. it is, see if it works yeah. for you. I promise you it'll work every time. All right. So you also brought this other product here, sir. And uh, Sarge has pushed Sousa on me before. Right. And I just didn't, at the time, I wasn't, I wasn't ready for the optics, but I hadn't heard of the company. And he it's, swears by it. Yeah, it's actually been out for a while. Um, it's a, uh, they started off as a Chinese knockoff, really, of just optics. You know, just kind of their bottom end, low rent optic uh, that you could get into. And a friend of ours uh, that has a big name company and is a savant when it comes to oh, it's got a cover. machining and creating stuff. Bought this company, uh, bought uh, Sun Optics, like that, and rebranded uh, the company basically. And they did away with a lot of the knockoff novelty style, style uh, optics and red dots, and they went to a more serious line. So I think they have, Sarge knows better than I do, but I think they have about six or eight SKUs uh, that they stuck with and just mastered and that that little rmr right there has got the same footprint as the trigicon yeah which is what so i have could, right there you could literally take your trigicon off take the base off of that slap that on there same thing yeah. it, look, it looks like it's got a little bigger sight picture a little bit bigger yes a little bit bigger uh i put that on a 17 put a 33 round uh one of my 33 round mags for my glock in it and had that RMR on there out at the range and ran it, never lost a zero. Nice. And it stayed on point. Nice. Did you lock type the uh, thing on there no, at all or just, no, I just, just factory just torque? Factory torque it down on there, just snugged on down, gave it a little after the snug and went out and ran it. And it runs like a champ. I mean, it's a great, it looks good. It, it operates good. and Yeah, you know, it does. It does look it's good. A, we got them at a phenomenal price point uh, on there, so you don't have to worry about uh, spending yeah. – you know, four hundred dollars for a reliable RMR. This for a rifle, or that's a raised sight. I see. Yeah, yeah, it's a uh, it's a little bit bigger, like that. It's more the red dot optics uh, style than it is an RMR oh. style. Comes with its own tools. Yeah, specialized tools. That's cool. Mm -hmm. And Pull this uh, guy out. Just oh, Sarge has run this on a three hundred blackout with and without suppressor on it, and he said it uh, it holds up to its paces. It, I was going to say, I think he actually said that this one was um, being donated to the show for my 300. Yeah. Okay. I think, he, I think, yeah. I think he, said, he didn't tell you about it. No, no, not at all. This is news to me, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So it's got its yeah. own. Oh, I like when they color the lens. Yeah. So it's got, it's a uh, anti-glare. Oh, that's why it's angled that way. Yeah. I can see there if you, I don't know how well it's going to show up on the camera, but you can see that the, the front lens is angled. Yeah, and those—I mean, those hold zero phen phenomenally, and, you, and you've got adjustment in them, so you can adjust it just like you would the crosshairs in a scope. You can zero it in, dial it in. And it'll I stay. like how clean the glass is. Yeah, um, glass quality is big when it comes to any sort of sight. You know, now uh, let's keep in mind that these are not Night Force or Leopold Mark Five HD lenses that are yeah. in these things. That they're they are a good lens. If you're out hog hunting, if you're out, you know, running and gunning little three gun comps here and there, yeah, you and your buddy type thing, they, these things will definitely do the do work for you. Yeah, uh, and and the purpose, like the reason he was recommending it to me, is my three hundred is basically a truck gun, yep. something I can carry around in a backpack that's going to be jostle around yep. all the time and and uh, put through its paces, just it hardly being shot. He and he knew and that. I've got the. I've actually have the. The RMR on my 1022 uh, charger takedown. Okay. Like that, and that thing's just amazing. Nice. Like okay. Makes so. it easy for my kids to use. They just 
so point you, and shoot. So you guys got optics. Yeah. And what one do you want to go to next? Do you want to go to the... Uh, yeah, let's go with, let's save go with the, the frame. The, yeah, the badass one we'll yeah. save for last. <laughs> yeah. So well, that's a uh, Gen 3 Glock 17 frame. Uh, and the, the story behind that is it was laser etched kind of when we first started laser etching, getting them done with a PD badge and number on it. And they put the wrong number on it and tried to go back over and fix it. And it just kind of destroyed it, messed it up. Uh, I was actually able to go back in and salvage it. Uh, We had to take all the stippling that they lasered in out. Uh, I went back in with a Dremel and we made the outline of the pattern a little bit deeper. Okay. And then I went back in with a, uh, a sand a glass grit yeah mixture and filled it all back in with that glass grit yeah and we cerakoted over it and now for anybody that's a gun person has had any sort of stippling done to their weapon um that's the most grip i've ever felt on a firearm and i would tell you right now if it was if it wasn't like the the grip on my my boba fett blaster over here that's a laser etched and it gave it more grip yes but that thing ain't moving. Mm-mm. That's locked in, mm-hmm. which is nice. Yeah. Um, and, and it's not. Uh, I know some of the grips that you can put in the aftermarket sticky pads. The uh, the glass grit is too rough, or it feels like it's just chewing your hands up. And that actually was surprisingly enough when we did it. Uh, and I wasn't real sure about how it was going to come out at first, but yeah. after we did it, it came out. I mean, it's it's grippy. It, it holds to you. But it doesn't feel like it's just yeah. hamburger in your hand yeah. as you're now, shooting. I haven't fired a weapon with that sort of stippling on there. And if you do work on my 43, oh, we'll, we'll let's do something up. like that. Oh, and yeah, then, definitely, uh, definitely. But uh, that, uh, it feels good just holding it. And, and I've, I've the grip tape, um, I got a buddy, George Lopez. He he uses it basically what they put on skateboards. Yeah, I, and that's what I started using. Yeah. First back in the day, and then they came out with... Uh, and it, it's it's basically the poor man's way of, of getting her done. Yeah. And it works. Yeah. It does work. Um, so I don't want to discount that if you don't have the money to go out and get something like this oh, there's, done. There's hundreds of different things out there that work yeah. and, and work well. Yeah. Terran, Terran Tactical actually makes some really good stuff that okay. the grip tape and stuff works. Yep. Uh, I've Personally, I've used skateboard tape, yep. like grip tape before, because it works. I yeah. mean, it's, it's hard not to prove that you know if you can keep a skater... Going downhill or up on those ramps on a skateboard, it's going to keep a gun in your hand. Yeah, I agree, and I like it. But let's get to the big dog. Also, the the Ruger five seven. So here we have the uh, the five seven by twenty eight. Oh, that's yeah. such a badass gun. The, All these have been pre checked, guys. They're not. Yeah. I promise. There's nothing in them. But uh, gun that, safety. Well, we'll that is show a you. hot rod right there. That is a Ruger did a, an amazing job on that. Did you do the the slide work here? No, actually, that comes, how it comes that comes out of the factory like that. It comes out of the factory like that. It's a longer slide, but this thing shoots. It's a a Ruger Air five seven, and it shoots um, <laughs> little rifle rounds. Is yeah. what they look like. Yeah, and uh, again, I like to act like I know what the hell I'm talking about when it comes to firearms. I know enough to 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 talk about them, but I I don't really know. Right. So I do know that this thing shoots little rifle rounds because um, I got it, an uncle that, is, that has one. Yeah, it's a smoking hot little round. It yeah. is a, definitely a race car of a of a pistol, that's for sure. What's the uh, feedback like when you're shooting that thing? You know what? It's not bad at all. Because I, it's, I it's, like uh, compared to a forty, a Glock uh, forty. Because I hate shooting forties. Hate it. Yeah, forties are too snappy. They, yeah, they got a lot a lot of flip to them. A lot of yep. snap. Uh, not a big fan of the forty Smith. Love what it does to the end product. Yeah. Not a fan of getting that end product down yeah. there. You know, I like nines. I'm a nine fan. Yeah. Love the nine millimeter classic yep. gun. I, lo- I love a 45 too. A big 45 ACP. Yeah. Gun. I, and it, it's weird to tell people that don't shoot that often. Um, when I shoot a Glock 45, for instance, compared to a 40, you would expect the 40 not to kick near as hard as a 45 it's because just, the, it's the opposite. Yeah. It's a smooth shooting gun. It's yeah. like when you shoot a 1911 and yep. you got a 45 in that, it's an amazing little round. It's, it's just so, that 45 is so slow, so big. So just, yeah. you know, shooting a school bus out of a little bitty gun is just, you know, 
Yep. It's just the way to go. Yeah. It's it's nice. But yeah, that's a if you want to donate that as well, we could we could donate that to the show. I'll go out of business if I keep donating. I know stuff you, to you. I know that's right. <laughs> um one of the things I do want to do <clears throat> is uh I want to get a a firearm from y'all and do one of those raffles. Oh. I want yeah. to do that. And I, I don't know I've never done it, and I'm sure you guys have the experience doing that stuff, and I've mm-hmm. seen people do that, so I'll have you guide me through that. But I would like to do that towards some sort of fundraiser towards one of these. Yeah, awesome let's, we'll do something. Yeah, let's do something for uh, some of the officers or something like that out there. We'll do something like that. Okay, I'll, I will build. I'll come up with, and uh, we'll let's collaborate later on. Yeah, like that. But yeah. You know, I'll put something together. I'll build something. I know on. you guys, and that's the other part. Like, you guys don't realize how much these guys donate all the time. It's constantly. I, I, I've i never heard of it. I come in the shop. Oh, what are you guys working on? Oh, we're building this for, you know, this company. We're doing this for this. And we're working on this donation gun over here. Yeah. And we're working on this donation gun over here. It's always the donation gun. So, oh, yeah. We do we do a lot for uh, Sarge's involved with the 10-7 organization. Yeah. We do a lot for them. Love those outdoors. guys. Yeah. Those are a great group of guys, and they have a great cause, and, and I'm proud to stand behind them on that. And, yeah. Uh, and we also do stuff for uh, the Folds of Honor Foundation. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we do guns for them. Um, Folds of Honor is a foundation based on fallen – Military members military, that yes. help out the families, families and stuff yes. for that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't have any connections with them, but I have no problem promoting them as well. I yeah. promote 10-7, which is for fallen uh, police officers. And then we also had the uh, Tunnels to Towers. The towers, yes. Came yes. in. Um, Winky Hicks. I did an episode with him, and uh, he donated – this awesome uh, ribbon, uh, uh, ribbon. There's a ribbon that was attached to it. It's a, a medal that you get when you run in their tunnel for tower uh, 5K. Right. Um, which is for not just fallen officers, but just first responders all the in first, general. Yeah, all the first responders so, that day. Yeah. Um, they, they pay off your house, basically. Yeah. Um, that's, that's one a, of the that's things they do. Yeah. Awesome group of people there. So I had them in there. So now I'm propping them up. And uh, let me think. What else do we got? Oh, I actually wrote a list of people, little shout outs I want to give to. So we got married to the badge. So that is a um, Christian based uh, foundation trying to help strengthen. Cause let's face it. Officers go through a lot of divorces. Yeah. So this is part of them supporting families. Uh, I saw so highly, I'm giving them a shout out, reach out to married to the badge on Facebook um, tunnel to towers. It's another one. Adopt a cop, uh, adopt a cop actually sent, these cool um, humanizing the badge. We off. You'll find these on your patrol cars. I tell you what, Eric. I'll adopt you. You can come over and clean my backyard. Your family is not that. ready for me. As long as you have a steady <laughs> supply of whiskey and pizza, we can get along just fine, brother. We we're, we'll get lit. That's fine. We'll I am all about lit. that. Yeah. Um, shout out to humanizing the badge. Uh, Officer Brandy was on here. She's a part of that humanizing the badge. She had five thousand views. Wow. On her video. Wow. I've got YouTube, right? I've got mm-hmm. people subscribed to the YouTube. We're over 500, by the way. Nice. So that was a nice. big one. Um, hitting that milestone. The next up is 1,000. So we hit 500 within 90-ish days. And then uh, now we're trying to hit 1,000 in the next 90 days. So, there you go. Um, but she was on here from Humanizing the Badge. Well, I'll tell you what, Eric. Uh, you get, uh, if we can hit 5,000 views on there like that, we'll get a, <laughs> we'll get a rookie I don't even have to be a rookie officer. We'll get an officer coming here, and I will get tased. I will let them tase me okay. on, on your show. Hell yeah. I can make that happen. I'm Let's still connected to an academy. so Let's do it. Um, I had a – so on our Instagram page, uh, I look I, – I'm still very involved. And so somebody likes a comment, likes a picture, likes anything. I look. You know, I'm yeah. trying to be involved with the, the viewer base. And so I saw Code 7 Coffee. Never heard of them. Code seven coffee. Love so, coffee. I love coffee. Love coffee. Drink it every day. So I'm like, okay, cool. They like something. So I sent his private message. Hey, I appreciate you guys supporting the show. Uh, I see you guys got your own. I checked them out. It's like, I see you guys got your own coffee thing. It was like, um, I like to drink black rifle coffee. I like gunship. Yes. That's my favorite coffee to drink. Do you have anything like that? And they're like, it's funny you mentioned that. We actually do. And that's, it was called like, uh, donut shop or something like that. Yeah. And then they like, it goes right in line with the name of your show. So well, no shit. Perfect. I was like, 
I'll buy a bag. Send it to me. I'll let y'all know what I think of it. I was like, and I'll promote it on the show. I said, win or lose. I, I, just because I don't like it doesn't mean I'm not going to recommend you. So um, it, that came out wrong. It, it, yeah, I may not like the taste, but I like the fact that <laughs> they're out there trying to grow their company. Right. Let's put it that way. Yeah. If I didn't, I believe in coffee, so I'm going to promote uh, coffee. Yeah, I'm a big coffee nut. So if well. I don't believe in what you promote, I'm not going to promote you. Right. Um, so Code 7 Coffee, I'm waiting for this. I just bought it yesterday, so waiting for that to come in. I'll let you guys know what I think of it. Um, but shout out to Code 7 Coffee and then Flock Camera System. Um, I've been talking with Flock a lot and are you familiar with the flock system I, at all no I'm dude not. okay so i'm a detective right right D- let's 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 go back okay fingerprints fingerprints came out right changed police work right and, uh j edgar hoover and the fbi and all them to keep in track they're doing fingerprint things and they figure out that it's unique and everybody's fingerprints are different and it just changes the world of policing as we know it then you got dna DNA evidence comes out, changes policing, right? For the better, catching all these bad guys. Right. And on top of that, not only are we catching bad guys, we're freeing people that were caught up, wrongly wrongly accused. accused. So um, I'm a big fan of that. I love that DNA evidence helps clear some of the scripts that works yes not democrat science (laughs) science that works not a political show (laughs) but uh (laughs) flock camera system in my opinion is that next big evolution when it comes to police work because me personally i use them every day now the way that it works cameras are set up strategically uh in high crime areas was this what you were telling us about the other day? That we yes. Oh, my God. That is amazing. Yes, dude. So I'll be sitting there, and I'll get a license plate and a, a time of day, and that's all I got. If they went past this flat camera system. Are you stalking me? I am. Oh. <laughs> uh, if they cross that camera system within however long your parameters are set. Let's say you only keep seven days of footage. Right. You can go back seven days. And let's say... All I know is it's a, a red car with blue wheels. I'm going to type in the parameters, red car, blue wheels. It will eliminate any car that passed that camera except for red cars with blue wheels. Wow. They're amazing. And now they've got stuff out there where you can go on your phone, and I can enter in cars that I'm looking for. Like if I if I get a picture of your vehicle, your suspect, I take that picture, I upload it to Flock, and now it's in the system, and the Flock camera system can locate that vehicle. Okay, it was northbound past our camera here it went here any type of day that's crazy dude it's the shit and, and people are like well do you want the bad guys to know about it yeah i do yeah. i want you to know i yeah. want you to know you're not gonna away get away with stealing somebody's vehicle which is the big reason behind it right uh, a, a big reason and uh i don't want you to know that you're not going to be able to flee the scene after you just murdered somebody yeah. and then i'm not going to find you like i want that knowledge to be out there to try to deter it i don't want somebody to have to be a victim before we catch them. Right. I want somebody to not even try it. What If your city doesn't have it, I'm sorry. I wish you would all get it. But if my city has it, I want you to know that the city I work in isn't the place you want to go commit a crime. Exactly. Because they're watching. Exactly. And, uh, and tell me what you think. You're not a law enforcement officer. As a non-law enforcement officer, I don't want big law, I, even as a cop, I don't want big brother watching me. Yeah. I'm a big, I'm a, Big proponent of you know keeping Big Brother it's out little, of my business. Yeah, it's I little want as little possible. as little as possible. But at the same time, knowing the laws that are out there, and this isn't the days of the Wild West where I you know I can walk down the street and I see somebody getting jacked up, try and just go snap them, right, and be done with it, and not have to worry about anything. Mm-hmm. I want law enforcement to have the tools yeah. that they need, not only to make their job easier, but keep them safe. And you yeah, know, keep criminals off the street. Yeah, you know, get, just, get to that point. I I like the checks and balances that are mm-hmm. currently out there for it. I don't want it. I don't. Part of my job is to make sure we don't go past what we're currently using it for. Right. And what we currently use it for, I don't just get on there and go. I'm going to look up and Steve's car. Another reason why I could never be a cop. Yeah, because ladies, if you're hot <laughs> and I get divorced, I'm stalking. <laughs> I'm just going to say, as I'm stalking, so, I'm a people person. Love to watch. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the that's where that line needs to be, and it needs to stay there. Yeah, I don't. We do. We need to. We're only using it 
through criminal investigations that you can prove. So I know I've got a case where a uh, catalytic converter, because one I work quite a bit, was taken. That's it, a big thing lately. I've oh, been hearing about. We had a, so much money in it. I heard uh, some lady at a, what was it, like a dollar store or a dollar general or something like that, work there, broad daylight guy, yeah, in and out. 20, 30 seconds, man. I'm like, it's quick. I just reached out to a, a member, uh, two cops, one donut member. I, I, was, had hers I, was, taken. I just want to say this to the criminals that are out there that are looking for catalytic converters. If you take mine, please delete my O2 codes so that I don't have to go get a bunch of work done. <laughs> Do me that favor. Yeah. I'm giving you a catalytic converter. Hook me up. Right. You know, you know. You're about to make make two grand off my catalytic converter. Yeah. You know, Give me yeah. a, throw me a bone. Yeah. Help me out a little bit. Yeah. But yeah, man, it's a. Uh, I'm real excited. I'm hoping we can get them as a sponsor because I truly believe they're the next phase of police work. Yeah. Um, they're going to change police work. And in, in, in a career field that is drastically having to change its tactics and, and go to a more hands-off approach, if you're going to give me that hands-off approach, give me the tools I need to investigate from a distance. Right. Because the days of... Um, chasing, chasing cars and stuff like that that's going away. There's just too, there's too many people on the road. There's too um, many different options as far as there's cameras everywhere, whether they're police cameras or not. So, Well, shoot, Textot's got yeah. cameras on every right. major highway. So it's not worth it for me to chase somebody yeah. that I maybe can catch a camera angle. And, and well, that and the fact you're taking, if, if you don't have to chase them right then and there, you're not putting other people in danger. Yes. Because you you know how you drive. Yep. You know your limitations of your patrol vehicle or whatever y'all call it, whatever you're in. Yep. You know your limitations in that. But you don't know yes. me on the street. You don't I don't know, I don't know how you're going to panic. Yeah. Whatever it is. You know. And uh, it's not worth somebody else getting killed. So um, I'm not saying I'm anti-pursuit. It's just... In most cases, I, I love just, to see a good pursuit every once in a while. I, I, I just, I'm not a big proponent yeah. for it. Um, and I'm, I may, you know, I want to see me wrong. I think they're fun. <laughs> my one thing on my bucket list is I want to see Fort Worth PD roll down the street in rush hour with a tank after somebody who snatched somebody's purse, just go over <laughs> the top, <laughs> off the wall. Machine guns mounted on top, just oh, rolling through traffic, pushing cars out of the way. There is no department that I can think of. That'd be, I mean. I think LAPD has tanks, though. Yeah. I think they do yeah. actually have legitimate, some sort of I mean, up-armored I'm type I'm sure tank. we get big enough, we can probably get Pendleton or somebody on the phone, get us a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're always moving them through. You see them moving through Crowley and through the DFW yeah. every once in yeah, a while. Dallas, trucks, maybe yeah. Dallas has some. I don't know. Yeah. Dallas did use a robot yeah. to get you take out a terrorist. So yeah. maybe we can get one of the local PDs in Abrams. You know? <laughs> Jesus. Do they have Abrams in the Marines or is that the Army? That's the Army. Army's all tanks, right? Yeah. yeah that's what I thought. Yeah. But yeah, well, what else is coming down the pipe, man? Anything big with business? Anything big personally? Uh well that you um, want to get out there? We are actually looking into we have a good friends of ours that are out of state that do most of our laser work for us when it comes to the laser etching on grips and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, and it's not that we don't want to hook them up or help them out, but we want to try to keep it more local and turn around times, make them faster. Yeah. Get that cost, drive that cost back down. So we're actually looking into uh, purchasing and getting into doing the lasers ourselves. Like that's so here. It's huge, man. I don't know a tie. I don't have a definite, a solid time frame on it yet, but we here pretty soon. Yeah, um, probably before the middle of next year. I'm going to say we got. Uh, we definitely uh, we'll be starting up a laser doing engraving, our own, doing our own laser engraving. Dude, that'd be sweet. Because right. again, that doesn't just have to be. Maybe doesn't anything. have to just yeah. be guns. Yeah, yeah. Because I did the the laser engraving. I went to San Antonio. Yeah, I got I got my first project in mind for you too. That I'm going to donate to you. Oh yeah. Yeah. Is it Star Wars related? No, brother. Shit. Well, I mean, you could. It could be a lightsaber in certain circles. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> I have a lightsaber. Uh, but, all right, man. Well, that's cool. I really hope you guys do get that. I do, too. I was, Sergeant, I've been talking a lot about it. And it's, yeah. the more we talk about it, the more it makes sense. Tell so. me he's going to have to shave his beard because you can't have that getting in the way of the laser. 
No, you, man, you can't take Chewbacca out of the picture. <laughs> you got. I think either. he looks more like an Ewok. Yeah, 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 yeah. For he's sure, he's too short for Chewbacca. Yeah, he looks like an Ewok, yeah. big time. Yeah, wander. <laughs> <laughs> Matter of fact, you know what? Now I'm gonna get him a walking stick. <laughs> oh God, do it! That would be great, and like a leather, a little leather hood, little hood. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. All right, brother. It's been a good show. I'm Man, glad you came. It's out been here. a pleasure. Thank you for having me. I'm, on. I'm glad that you guys are still rocking and rolling as a sponsor. Um, you guys have been great. Nothing but kudos and thanks from us. Uh, we'll keep promoting you as long as. Um, you guys want us to, I guess, oh, for sure, <laughs> for we, sure. Till we rock the boat in a direction you don't Man, like, and we'll we'll be we'll be love we'll love to come back on and help you out and do yeah. what we can until you get tired of us. Yeah, so. I'll yeah. keep showing the new guns you guys put out here. Yeah. If you get any special projects or stuff you want shown, obviously you've definitely paid for the right to have that. Well, so on on that note, real quick though, we do have since the holidays are just almost right around the corner. Um, ladies, if you're out there watching, <laughs> Jesus. like that. Nothing better to get your guy than a two gun set. Oh, so we yeah. do two, we do two gun sets. Yeah, we do three gun sets. Um, um, custom builds for like training day. Yeah, and the the two. What what was he carrying? I can't well, remember. Uh, yeah, but we do also on yeah. the AR packages and stuff. So you know, oh. everybody's got a five five six at home. Yeah, you know, so you don't have to go out and buy a whole new firearm. We can do you a three hundred blackout. You know, up package with that. Yeah. You know, so you get a five five six three hundred blackout. Do three fifty legend. All three of those rolled up into one. Nice. I've been avoiding so. showing the rifle y'all built for me until I get it seracoded. Because right now it's just it's basic. Oh, it's just a black, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's just yeah. We it, we didn't seracode it at all. Okay. Um, that's well, you got to show them a before before we do the after. I will, I will when the time comes. Yeah. I want I'll, I will show that part. But I want to. I definitely want to get it prettied up. I just don't know what I want it to look like. Well, I've got I've got one for you. The next time that I'm on, I'm going to bring up here. Uh, I'm doing for a gentleman who's a big Star Wars nut. Okay. We're turning his shotgun, just kind of a teaser. All right. And we're turning his shotgun into a lightsaber. Nice. Glow in the dark. What? Think about that. Okay. So the barrel's going to glow. Yeah. Okay. Nice. This is going to be. Epic. I didn't know Cerakote had a glow in the dark paint. Well, it's it's not through Cerakote. It's a different provider. Uh, we mix it with the Cerakote. Uh, okay, like that, and it's going to be the Mace Windu, <gasps> the purple. The yes, hell yeah. yeah. So it's See, I'm a white. big nerd. That's yeah. my favorite lightsaber, by yeah. the way. That's awesome. Because I went to TCU, so I'm a yeah. big purple fan now. Yeah, and uh, no, that's awesome. Hell yeah, yeah. Yeah, for those that don't know, when he's talking about the five five six platforms and changing it up and all that stuff, um, the way they built my three hundred blackout, um, the barrel can swap out. Yeah, um, we can take the barrel right off, and I can go right to my five five six platform, which I don't have another one of the converters to just slap my five five six on you. So what you're saying is you need another converter? Yeah, yeah. What is that thing mm -hmm. called again? The cry havoc. That's the cry havoc. It's the cry havoc. Yeah. That's what it's called. And, and that's a really that's a great system. On there, um, just like anything else for the AR. I mean, it's over the top. Yeah, it is. But it's, it, yeah. But it's 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 awesome. It's fun. Yeah, it's fun. It's, it's cool awesome. to have. Yeah. And that's what we were going for. I wanted yeah. something that we could break down as small as possible. And it's different. And it's different. And it's different. And uh, the next the, the next big thing I want to get done is he has a buddy apparently in Arlington that um, can integrally suppress, mm -hmm. and that's what I would like to do to that. I just can't afford that yeah. yet <laughs> so and i won't be able to afford that till this is all finished right so right i still have things like i gotta get another com that's not even my Baby computer steps. yeah Baby yeah steps. I'm, we'll it's the, that's my problem is i'm oh I'm, I'm i want the end yeah so i can have the best while i'm doing it and i just yeah. i just need to slow my ass down yeah. slow my roll as the rock would say so right. but all right brother been a good show awesome i'm glad to have you awesome love to have been here Thanks for coming out, man.